percentage when the deviation is greater than 4 degrees and it creates a net varus or valgus moment and an excess stress on one side of the knee and the excessive wear and early failure so the forces of leg pass through the center of the hip knee and the ankle as you know to allow the optimal load share through the medial and the lateral sides of the process so alignment is nothing but hitting the target every time you do it so what are the axes of alignment they are the coronal the sagittal and the axial see coming to anatomy the native knee alignment varies throughout the population and stuart all said that hip knee angle angle of normal adults is 1.2 degrees of varus and only 2.2 percentage has it at zero and in asymptomatic adults the varus knee are uh, greater than 3 degrees is in men are 32 percentage and 17 in females but in symptomatic arthrosteoarthritic patients the varus alignment is 71 percentage coming to a few uh, anatomical lines the coronal axis the anatomical axis of tibia is the center of the tibial medullary canal to the proximal joint it is around the tibia is around 3 degrees of varus compared to the vertical axis as you all know the mechanical axis of the tibia is from the center of the tibial spines to the center of the weight bearing of the distal tibia it's usually same as the anatomical axis but just little lateral to that the anatomical axis of the femur is from the center of the femoral medullary cavity medullary canal to the midpoint of white sides axis it exists at the intercondylar notch and which is the entry of the intramedullary rod for the femoral jig and it's approximately 9 degrees valgus compared to the sen- midline okay and the mechanical axis of the femur you know is from the center of the head to the center of the knee joint the anatomical femorotibial angle is should be around 6 degrees plus or minus 3 and the mechanical femorotibial axis which is the from the center of the femoral head to the medial tibial spine to the center of the angle and the medial the mechanical uh, femorotibial angle is the and between the 3 degree valgus femur and the 3 degree varus tibia resulting in a zero or a neutral mechanical alignment it's same as the hip knee angle angle or it may be in a real time it is 3 degrees valgus when you take the vertical axis the valgus cut angle is nothing but uh, when you take the mechanical axis it but the, the femoral anatomical and the difference between the mechanical and the anatomical axis the distal femur is cut usually at around 5 to 7 degrees of valgus to put the femoral processes mechanically neutral but when you have short patients you have to increase the uh, uh, valgus greater than 7 and when you have tall patients you can have to reduce it when you see the uh, standing phase in a single stance and on a dual stance on uh, gait it's the mechanical axis is usually around 3 degrees to the vertical but it comes perpendicular only when it is when you have an east east standing position so in a single stance and a double stance in a gait usually the varus tibia native tibia 3 degree varus is usually perpend uh, parallel to the uh, ground because of this 3 degrees coming to the a spectrum of varus and valgus deformities can be there due to the femoral deformities the tibial deformities or the joint deformities from a small deformity to the to the greatest because of go bone destruction the sagittal and rotation alignment i am not going to deal much because the successive speakers are going to touch upon that we'll just go to the what are the different methods of aligning a total knee arthroplasty the anatomical alignment this was described in 1985 by the hungerford and krakow it aims at a neutral limb alignment with an oblique joint line relative to the mechanical axis of the limb it provides better load distribution in the tibial component to improve the patellofemoral biomechanics and it places the joint line parallel to the ground in single stance and the bilateral stance phase of the normal gait 
Surgeon's accuracy of placing the components within three degrees of target is less than 70 with a conventional total knee arthroplasty instrumentation. So aiming for a two to three degree virus may result in outliers and early failures. For this reason of the precision and reproducibility, it is largely abandoned then. And this came, became the precursor for the coming kinematic alignment. The mechanical alignment. This was the first to come in 1970s by Freeman and Swanson, but later it was popularized by Insall in 1985. And following the failures of anatomical alignment, mechanical alignment became the gold standard for decades. And the place, it places the femoral component perpendicular to the coronal mechanical axis of the femur. So the aim is to create a neutral limb, lower limb to achieve balanced load distribution between the medial and lateral compartments. But only 0.1 patients of percentage of patients have a neutral mechanical axis, even though the mean of the population as a whole is neutral. When you have a varus knee in a mechanical alignment, you remove more of bone from the lateral tibia than the medial tibia. You remove more bone from the distal femoral condyle, medial femoral condyle than the lateral femoral condyle and the posterior medial femoral condyle than the posterior lateral femoral condyle. So this results in a horizontal joint line and the medial collateral ligament tightness in flexion and extension might require release, but lateral collateral ligament tightness in flexion may be accommodated by the natural and acquired LCL laxity. But balancing of soft tissues in the mechanical alignment inevitably alters the natural knee kinematics. Thou shall not virus or else shall revise. So if you put up uh, implant in virus, it's destined to go to fail and you will have to go revise it. Parrot et al. in 2010 said, until additional data, a neutral mechanical axis remains a reasonable target and, as a, and considered as a standard. But if, if the mechanical aligned uh, knees are on static radiographs, there is evidence that on dynamic loading of the mechanically neutral total knee arthroplasty, it is not balanced. So then came the kinematic alignment. As technology, implant technology has improved, the issue of component wear and loosening has gone out and the concept of restoring a patient's native anatomy has gained increasing traction. So Howell et al. described a true resurfacing of the knee joint. With the implant thickness to replace the exact amount of bone at cartilage removed, and software package is used to recreate the pre disease tibiofemoral relationships by compensating for a cartilage wear and achieved by the cutting blocks designed on the basis of the MRI of the knee. The tibial slope is matched to the patient's native slope, and the axial rotation of the femur is set according to the posterior condylar uh, uh, of the and com with the compensation of the wear and the axial rotation of the tibia is set perpendicular to the line drawn from the center of the medial and the lateral tibial plateaus and does not create any gap imbalances so ligament releases are not required and the balancing is described by the decision tree of Howell as if tight in flexion and extension, remove more of tibia, tight in extension, you remove the posterior osteophytes, strip the posterior capsule or decrease the tibial slope. If it is tight in flexion, you increase the posterior tibial slope. If it is tight medially, you remove the medial osteophytes and recut the tibia in varus or you lateralize the tibial component. Or if it is tight in the lateral side, you remove lateral osteophytes. If not possible, recut the tibia in more valgus and medialize the tibial component. What are the potential benefits of uh, kinematic alignment? Is achieving by transforming the arthritic knee into a pre-arthritic state uh, with 3D monitoring and more physiological and restoring three kinematic axis of the knee, which is the transverse axis or the epi trans epicondylar axis about which the tibia flexes and extends and the transverse axis in the femur about which the patella flexes and extends 
and the longitudinal axis of the tibia around with the tibia internally and externally rotates on the femur. So then came the functional alignment which evolved using the advanced surgical aids like computer navigation and robotic assisted total knee arthroplasty. So res resection thickness and the gap joint gaps and the ligament, ligament alignment, limb alignment are all assessed intraoperatively once the osteophytes are removed and it also allows the software to generate potential size of potential gaps in both in extension and flexion and the precision of uh, reduces the risk of missing the target and alignment outliers and the gap can be balanced by changing the implant targets in all the three planes valgus in the femur and the varus in the tibia with an obliquity of the joint line which is a stored which the soft tissues dictate. And in fixed deformities, the ligament release may be required, but the extent and the frequency is small. Thus, avoiding an over resection and the height of the joint line is maintained because of the over resection of the uh, uh, distal femur is not there. So, avoid the mid bit fraction instability. It also avoids under resection. So that we have, we don't need to use a thinner poly, which may produce a flexion instability. So what are the takeaways? The femoral joint is in three degree valgus to the relative, uh, related to the mechanical axis, as you all know. The femoral shaft is six degrees valgus related to the mechanical axis. And in if you are using a mechanical alignment, you uh, cuts are perpendicular to the mechanical axis, and you cut the tibia in at zero and femur at six degree valgus. And in anatomical element, we try to recreate the joint line. That is, you cut the tibia at a native three degree varus and femur at nine degree valgus. And if you have, an, have the advanced surgical aids like navigation and robotics, you should always go for functional alignment to mimic the native knee in the lines of anatomical alignment. But with conventional instrumentation, mechanical alignment should be your choice. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anin, for uh, making the very complex topic simple. How to go about achieving the alignment that you uh, plan? It, you have to use the instrumentation for what all instrumentation we use in TKR and how to reuse them well. That will be helped by Professor Shingar Avadivedi, sir. He is a uh, professor of uh, Madras Medical College. He is past president of Madras Orthopedic Society. He is an AO faculty. He is vice president of uh, Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association. He has a special interest in pelvic stabula surgery and in arthroplasty. So I welcome sir and sir kindly share your screen. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh. At the outset, I wish to thank uh, the OSS and uh, the organizer, uh, Dr. Uh, Rajesh for having given me this uh, opportunity. You are able to see the screen? Yes, sir. We can see, sir. Yeah. Full screen. So, uh, Dr. Anin has made my job very easy by telling about uh, all the types of alignment, how to establish that alignment. My topic is about how to get that right by using the jigs and rods and the tools which have been given <coughs> to us. So, our basic aim in doing a TKR is to establish an equal rectangular flexion gap and the extension gap. This is the crux of the entire surgery. So you have to get a rectangular gap, it should not be trapezoidal. It should be the same in flexion as well as in extension. So we are uh, having uh, the jigs and instruments. So most of the time, when as an arthroplasty surgeon, if you start, the company person should not dictate how to use the rod and how to use the jigs and how to keep it. So we have to understand the concept of all these jigs in which it has been maintained. So if a knee, if it comes like this, it has to be adequately imaged to find out what are all the deformities apart from the knee joint and to establish a mechanically aligned knee. So as Dr. Meen, Alin uh, concluded that there are so many alignments, the functional alignment, the kinematic alignment, the mechanical alignment, we'll confine ourselves to the mechanical alignment of the total knee replacement. That is to get a parallel joint line to the ground when the patient stands. So though the jigs are there, if it is not used carefully, properly, then it can result in these kind of worst complication like a bad notching, which will result in 
uh, supracondylar fracture which cannot be prevented as the patient stands and walks. So this is what we have to avoid and what are the steps we will see in the subsequent slides. So we have to get a aligned, well mechanically aligned knee joint. So that is our aim to get the long lasting, the survivorship of the knee joint. So essentially the basic concept is when you take a distal cut, the extension gap is produced. So the distal cut decides only about the extension gap. And if you take a posterior cut, that decides about the flexion. So this flexion and extension, the tibia remains the same. It is only the distal cut or the posterior cut which decides the extension gap and the flexion gap. So as he has eloquently described, I will not go into detail, the proximal, medial, tibial and the lateral femoral, it is not perpendicular, it is 3 degree varus. So we are taking a perpendicular cut in extension. And we also know that for the tibial cut, we use an extra medullary jig to get a perpendicular cut and the femur to get the mechanical axis right extra medullary it is difficult so we use an intra medullary rod we have already calculated the angle normally for a mechanically aligned knee it is enough if you take a six degree constant so it can be six or five or seven depending upon surgeon but we make it constant and we take so that is the idea so how to get that so to get the extension gap you are taking a perpendicular cut overlooking the three degree of varus so we call, compensate it in the femur and we get a rectangular gap. So we will come to the flexion a little later. So you position it adequately exposed and sublux the uh, tibia before we start using our jigs. Unless if it is adequately visualized, our jigs may not be in right position to take the right cuts. So once it is done for the tibia first we will finish, tibia is simple. So since the anatomical and mechanical axis are the same, we have to ensure that in the coronal plane and the sagittal plane, it is parallel to the anatomical axis. So in an obese person, it may be difficult. For that, you have to come little away and visualize the entire leg and the extra medullary. So the ankle clamp is there. You have to make sure that it is not in varus or in valgus. It is in the center. For that, the points are it should be in the medial third of the tibial tuberosity. And this should be facing the second toe. And if you see that there is no, because our eye can even detect even one or two degrees. So this is a better way for a coronal alignment. For the sagittal alignment, you just go away as similarly as I said. You can just make sure that the gap between in the proximal and the distal is twice. So if it is one finger breadth, this should be two finger breadth. Or if it is two, it is four. So that will almost in most of the cases, that will ensure that the sagittal alignment is obtained. So this is the mechanic, the uh, extra medullary jig which will make sure and you will be taking the proximal tibia how much thickness not going to the deep defect will uh, I will not deal in that so because we will confine ourselves to the jigs so this is one but most of the time if it is an obese patient to place this jig if it is not a minimally invasive jig and if it has got both medial and lateral fins it, to insert it it may be a little difficult and the spike which is here which might push the uh, proximal jig into little varus so to avoid that you can just push it little, it is always a good idea, one segment medially. So that will make sure that you are uh, parallel in the coronal alignment. So this, you can, instead of keeping it in the center, you can just push it little medial, so that it will be exactly parallel in the coronal plane. So this will not make it more into varus cut. So that is one which you can, tip which you can take. So in addition to medial third of the tibial tuberosity, center of the ankle, this point into the second, this can be pushed little. This is good for the PS knees because in posterior cruciate substituting or a cruciate sacrificing, you are going to take a neutral cut or a three degree posterior slope inbuilt, not more than that. If it is a CR knee, you tend to take the natural slope, it will be six or seven degree up to 11 degree it can be taken. So that you have to be very, very careful. So the posterior tibial slope, the sagittal alignment, if it is going to be CR, it is different. So I use a cruciate substituting and we'll describe for the tibia cruciate substituting. If you are a CR surgeon, you have to include the posterior tibial slope also. If you are using a CR knee and you are going to take a posterior slope, always remember if it is not in the middle and if you take a posterior slope, it will be exactly posterior slope. If you have offset it little medial or little lateral, it will not be dead posterior slope. You will be in addition producing a posteromedial slope or a posterolateral slope. 
this you must always be aware if you are doing a crna and taking a posterior slope cut so you have to make sure that you are in the midline when you are doing a cr the ps you can go little medial or lateral and if you take a perpendicular cut that doesn't matter that is as far as the tibia is concerned for the femur as dr anin already mentioned it has to be an intramedullary rod because the intramedullary rod passes along the medullary canal and that establishes the anatomical axis we know that we are going to take a 6 degree off from the anatomical axis so if you carefully see the x ray the medullary canal if it if you go into the center the center point is not exactly the depression between the medial and lateral condyle the medial condyle overhangs up to this place it is not exactly medial condyle stops here lateral condyle doesn't stop in the midline the medial condyle goes up to the lateral aspect of the intercondylar area so if you are taking the drill and if you have not made a pilot hole and directly using this reamer then if you put it in the midline and you direct it towards this side because this is where the femur is lying directly then it can push the intramedullary reamer more laterally it has to be exactly 5 to 8 mm anterior to the posterior condyle pcl origin and the intercondylar area so it is better to start directing it more medially first to make an impression here and then redirect the medullary rod to the lateral aspect i hope you understand because there is a slope it is not exactly the valley apex of the valley is not in the midline it is a slope so you tend to direct it on the medial aspect and once you have made an impression you are sure that the drill will not slip then you take this along the medullary canal so you make sure that you are going exactly in the because the distal femur it is wide it can go more laterally or medially and still access the medullary canal but that will alter the angle of the uh, between anatomical and mechanical axis and that will alter the cut so this you have to be very very careful once you have done that you pass the intramedullary rod so this intramedullary rod has to go and engage the isthmus that is when there will not be any rocking and you can make sure that it is in the anatomical axis once it is done this has to sit in one of the condyle and then this distal cutting block is mounted so once this is done this always cuts the thickness of the implant what you are going to use normally the 9 mm so you just cut it uh, you place it and pin the distal cutting block once this is blocked don't take the cut immediately you just make sure the blade is going to just graze through the intercondylar area if it is cutting deep it means that there is lot of distal femur you are going to take so that is not good if it is not at all cutting the intercondylar area you are going to take this condyle separate this condyle separate then it means that you are not exactly remove the adequate distal femur and if there is any flexion deformity you can take 2 mm more so that you just cut the intercondylar area along with these two condyles so that you make sure so once you have made sure then take it once you have finished the distal cut the flexion it comes i am not going to talk in detail about measured resection and gap balancing which the subsequent speaker is going to so we normally combine the both measured resection and gap balancing you have to know both so the major difference is measured resection and gap balancing is the way in which the femoral rotation is determined because the femoral rotation decides the uh, equality or the medial and lateral space are equal so that is what it decides so if you see the distal femur in flexion so this is the posterior condylar axis so when there is a medial varus the varus of the proximal tibia the same way the posterior condylar axis also there is 3 degree so if you take it parallel to the posterior condylar axis you have already taken you have not taken 3 degree varus cut you have taken a perpendicular cut the medial gap will be narrow the lateral gap will be wide so you have to release medially more so that is the reason when posterior condylar axis which is the commonest way in which we decide the rotation you have to take a 3 degree external rotation to the posterior condylar axis so this rotation decides the flexion gap so when it is exactly parallel to the proximal tibial cut then the medial gap and the lateral gap is going to be equal if it is little oblique this way then the medial gap is going to be narrow or if it is this way it is going to be lateral gap is going to be narrow so how do you decide about it so this is the posterior condylar axis 
this is the interepicondylar axis transepicondylar axis and this is the white sides line white sides line is the apex of the trochlear notch i mean the intercondylar notch and the base of the trochlear probe you draw a line a line which is perpendicular is the rotational axis each one has got its own fallacy but every time as beginners we have to do everything all the three axes you do and then make the cut so it, the aim is to take a parallel cut to the proximal tibia so that you have a rectangle here so the ways are one is trans epicondylar axis the second is the posterior condylar axis third is the white sides line so this is the jig there are so many varieties of jig you have to understand everything so this foot plate rests on the posterior condyle so most often when we do a varus knee the posterior condyles are not worn out that much as to compare to the distal femoral condyle so posterior condyle is intact so if you take this axis if you rotate it 3 degree so this decides how much rotation you can keep so if you rotate 3 degree then it is roughly the parallel to the proximal tibial cut so this is one the second is this anterior stylus this tells you the diameter antero posterior diameter that decides the size of the femoral component once the size is decided you take a trial femoral component and the posterior half of the distal femur you just see there should not be overhand it should not be so much small so that is the right size so this is the anterior stylus the anterior referencing i will come little later so once this posterior condylar axis is decided so the foot plate will sit here and if you rotate if this is the posterior condylar axis you have a 3 degree external rotation that is almost always right but in a valgus knee the lateral condyle posterior aspect is worn out so much if you take a posterior condylar axis even if you externally rotate this is the normal epicondylar axis it cannot match this because this is almost 10 to more than 15 degree even if you rotate 3 degree it will be still the lateral side will be open more medial side will be too close and you will not get a flexion gap that is the reason you have to have the trans epicondylar axis and the white sides line so for the trans epicondylar axis in the medial side the medial collateral origin the soft spot this is the epicondyle so it is not a single point the medial epicond the medial collateral ligament is such a wide structure the center soft spot and the lateral side it is a sharp point which you can take so that you do it so this you can keep your finger and then mark the white sides lines you mark and then you make the pin hole and then make sure that it is parallel to the epicondylar axis if it is neutral or externally rotated the petal attracts well but if it is internally rotated that is the worst thing for the petal of femoral tracking so that subluxes and that is very bad for the patient and patient satisfaction will not be there so if you are posted the rotation of the femoral component is not right then there will be lateral opening this has been taken little internally rotated so you can see the lateral opening more medial opening is not that much so this has to be compensated by releasing the anterior femoral the mcl or other structures balancing the ligament so this totally it alters the kinematics of the knee joint this has to be avoided so always when you pin put the block you make sure that it is parallel to the upper tibial cut that is the reason why if you take a proximal tibial cut first it will always be easy for you to assess that though you say all these axes there are so much of error if you take trans epicondylar axis inter observer error is 28 degree ap axis white sides line is 32 degree posterior condylar axis is 27 degree so there is so much of uh, error which can be there so you have to always make sure that it is parallel to the proximal tibial cut this was a varus knee which i did recently a week ago so even though it is a varus knee this is epicondylar axis i mark still it means that there is external rotation which is more so if the external rotation is more you can see that there can be an anterior notching so once it is pinned you can see that there is an anterior notching and the uh, it is the worst result what you can get so this is this you have to adjust it so the anterior referencing then we will come to the last part the anterior referencing anterior referencing if you keep the stylus and if you pin it anteriorly will not notch 1 mm below the anterior cortex the blade will go so it will not notch the anterior cortex if you are altering the size if you are downsizing the component then it will take more posterior cut 
the anterior cut will remain the same as you keep on downsizing more posterior bone will be taken that will increase the flexion gap so if it is an anterior sizing uh, component then if you downsize it you will take the more posterior posterior condyle and it will result in bigger flexion gap so when you take an anterior cut it should be a grand piano sign this should be one third the medial side should be one third the lateral side so that will be the uh, uh, indication that you have taken the cut rightly it should not be a butterfly or it should not be two semicircles and if you take the cut on the medial side you have to protect the mcl this is the mcl on the lateral side you have to protect the popliteus tendon if it is posterior referencing for example if you pin it here and put the Comp, uh, the jig it will be anterior referencing in this uh, system if you pin it here and if you place the jig here it will be constant here it will always take a constant posterior cut so that the flexion gap is not altered but you will be deepening the anterior cut so you have to be very careful when you are using a posterior referencing in posterior referencing the posterior cut is constant anteriorly you will be taking more and more cut if you are downsizing so you have to know what uh, system you are using so this is the pin for the posterior referencing this is the pins for the anterior referencing so whichever you are going to use you have to use it but you have to make sure that it is parallel to the proximal tibial cut so this is an example for the posterior referencing so if you keep it here as the component is high the blade will go up on the anterior cortex if you downsize it then the blade will go lower so you are keeping on decreasing the anterior cut so what is the importance the posterior cut how much you take is very very important because this offset you must always remember how much it is that is the one which is going to give you the flexion range if your offset is low if it is not established the actual offset then there can be flexion instability and the flexion can be decreased so you have to establish the posterior offset the posterior referencing always maintains the flexion gap but you have to be careful about notching anterior referencing it is uh, if you are downsizing it increase the flexion gap so finally coming to the positioning of the tibial component you have to know all these lines this is the posterior condyle or line this is the anterior aspect of the lateral condyle so the right size for the tibia is the one which fits from here to here on the lateral side so you have to delineate the anterior lateral border and the posterior border this is the right size then you align it to the posterior condyle these two and then you have to externally rotate so that the anteromedial aspect of the tibial component is aligned here so the anterior and posterior it is the right size and you externally rotate so that this is called as the baldini's line so when it is corresponding to the anteromedial surface then that is the right position for the tibia because it has to be externally rotated internal rotation again will land into trouble so this should be facing once you have finished this should be facing the tibial tuberosity and again you will have to check before you take the final preparation that it should be in the middle and it should be facing the second toe so finally to take home message will be you understand the instruments what is the concept of each Uh, jig you are using get the e gaps equal don't try to get it by increasing the releases and it has to be symmetrical both in extension and flexion and do a proper ligament balancing thank you again for the opportunity thanks thank you very much sir so as sir said you have to know the instruments and you should be the person who was uh actually deciding what to do it should not be the technician which is who is helping you next we will be discussing how to do the preoperative planning for this it would be delivered by dr ajit kumar sir he is senior consultant orthopedic surgeon at the adesuni hospital and shantaram shetty institute of orthopedics and traumatology bangalore uh he did his ms and mbbs from kmc manipal and he did his mch uh from liverpool he is the uh, currently he is the member of the ao governing council of india over to you sir thank you can you hear me and yes sir. thank you very much uh, dr rajesh and uh, also to the uh, executive committee of oss uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity a pleasure to be here 
and uh, my brief is to talk on the preoperative planning in total knee arthroplasty i think way back in the 18th century benjamin franklin said by failing to prepare you are preparing to fail and as with any other uh, major surgical procedures whether it is trauma or elective orthopedics preoperative planning is very vital and uh, preoperative planning starts right from a detailed history taking a proper and thorough physical examination adequate uh, imaging or appropriate investigations including laboratory tests so that at the end of the all that you achieve your surgical goals which is mainly restoration of the neutral mechanical axis preservation of the joint line restoration of the coronal and sagittal balance maintenance of patellar tracking and restoration of the posterior tibial slope all of which uh, have been briefly dealt with but in detail will be dealt with in subsequent talks so that's the ultimate aim of any uh, total knee arthroplasty so coming to the history is important to take a very detailed and elaborate history you need to know the mode of onset the progression of the symptoms how uh, impactful it is on the activities of daily living what sort of treatment has has uh, been undertaken whether any previous surgeries have happened or any other trauma uh, uh, has happened in the past the physiological age of the patient the comorbid conditions in particular uh, regards smoking diabetes and peripheral vascular disease these are very crucial in the outcomes of total knee arthroplasty and of course what is the expectation the patient has from this surgery and of and what the surgeon uh, will be able to uh, address uh, the, the patient's demands so, so all these are very vital in the history taking now coming to the physical examination it's important to assess the physique of the patient the body mass index uh, anything over 35 to 40 uh, has um, poorer outcomes and more complication rates the skin condition at the local area at least is very very uh, crucial in our uh, surgical execution uh, very vital to assess the ligament stability the range of movement at the knee there are enough papers to suggest the more the range of movement at the uh, time of surgery better the pro post op uh, range of movement also assess the hip and spine and rule out any focus of infection whether it is the urinary tract dental or even skin conditions and it's very vital to look at the psychological profile of our patients because these are chronic conditions many of them have uh, uh, internalized all their symptoms and have in a, a, a situation where they are in a chronic depression state and the outcomes in such patients is poorer coming to the higher body mass index all of us know that it's a uh, very the rates of infection wound infection is higher here more importantly intraoperative complications like uh, ligament injuries and uh, particularly patellar tendon injuries have been described and composition malpositioning is uh, quite often the case in such patients so we have to be very very uh, uh, judicious in our uh, performance of uh, total knee arthroplasty in such patients so looking at the uh, skin condition this one is second i didn't get that could you try again i'm sorry there's some hitch there no need to apologize sir i think it was some artificial intelligence which was talking which was probably uh, talking to me i think is it the siri you just come inside yeah. yeah somebody interfering there so if you have a skin condition like this, sorry about that this needs to be treated at the outset before you think of embarking on uh, uh, surgery and particularly multiply scarred or uh, incised uh, knees 
one has to make sure that there is enough uh, skin bridge between the incisions and ideally it's the lateral most incision that is preferred for uh, performance of the knee if you have multiple uh, longitudinal incisions when you have a severely deformed uh, knee like this watch the patient walking look for the varus or in some cases valgus thrust so that you uh, know the ligamentous uh, stability also in such severe knees there is significant bony depression so you need to be prepared with uh, uh, alternative equipment like uh, wedges or even uh, sleeves in certain situations so or even a uh, higher constraint knee in such situation so you need to assess these uh, patients thoroughly preoperatively and if you have a stiff knee you may even have to perform a tibial tubercle osteotomy and uh, in such patients you at you are at a higher risk of vascular injuries when you are performing your cuts so you need to be very experienced very or at least take the help of an experienced surgeon when you are uh, encountering cases such as these um always examine the spine and the hip as was mentioned earlier because you can have problems higher up or on the same side in the hip so if you have a situation like that a uh, severely arthritic hip has to be addressed first before you go on to replacing the knee coming to the uh, imaging ideally a standing ap lateral a skyline view of the patella and a scanogram is preferred but most of us do not routinely get a scanogram but many a times you may be caught up, caught out with a deformity in the uh, mid thigh or even further up similarly in the lower limb as well so a detailed history if there were fractures if there were uh, uh, any previous surgeries these are important uh, and also ideal to get a scanogram often it helps to get stress views to look at the ligamentous uh, stability and al- always get a spine x ray in uh, all your patients you see the difference between the weight bearing x ray on the uh, uh, right on your right as opposed to the one on the left so it's important that whenever you get an x ray of your knee uh, patients get it in a standing mode uh, lying down x rays sometimes uh, do not give you the true picture and also uh, about the uh, sulcus the hypoplasty of uh, hypoplasia of the lateral uh, uh femoral condyle it can be visualized in this as also the tracking of the patella uh, can be gauged by that the axes have been described in both the talks uh, previously so it's important that you have a scanogram get your anatomical axis as well as the mechanical axis and uh, make sure that uh, you plan out properly to achieve your uh, mechanical axis in the post op situation so in extra articular deformities you may have to perform a two stage surgery or if you have navigation or nowadays the robotics you can proceed uh, without too much of difficulty if you have massive defects you may need uh, bone grafting you may need allografts you may sometimes need a wedge uh, so you need uh, and the stem extension so you need to be prepared for the for all that get rid of the osteopites early make sure you can uh, balance the knee before you take the cuts in a severe deformity like this you at the outset itself have to be mentally prepared for uh, wedges or bone grafts and uh, occasionally a higher constraint knee if the medial collateral is uh, totally lax you need to be prepared for a higher constraint knee um be careful with your uh, uh, lateral popliteal nerve in such situations you need to talk to the patients about that explain to them uh, those possibilities the lab investigations the routine investigations are important but apart from that the uh, blood urea creatinine is helpful in some uh, chronic diabetics particularly and also your uh, serum albumin levels uh, are very vital besides this of course your counseling with the patients is very uh, crucial Uh, you need to gain their confidence you need to tell them the realistic expectations that they can have the role of uh, preemptive analgesics is also important also more important is the post op uh, protocol that the patients have to adhere to to get a good functional range of movement and what are the do's and don'ts after the uh, surgery these are all important things that we need to discuss beforehand with the 
patients. So coming to the take home messages, we need to select our patients appropriately. We need to choose the appropriate type of uh, implant and prosthesis, place it accurately as will be discussed in subsequent talks, achieve stability and in, by anticipating all these problems, you minimize the complications. You tell your team in the theater what your expectations are so that they are also prepared. And this reduces the time for surgery, reduces the rate, rate of infection. So with accurate placement, the longevity of total knee replacement increases, reducing the re revision rate with improved functional outcome and also the radiological outcomes. So it's... Uh, Many, many a times templating is also helpful, but nowadays people are doing digital templating, so may not be that uh, relevant now, but it is good if you are familiar with the templating techniques as well. So thank you very much for your attention and a happy Diwali to everybody. Thank you, Ajit sir, for uh, dealing the uh, pre-operative uh, planning in an extensive manner. You have touched everything. You have as, uh, touched the deformity assessment, the preoperative assessment, everything. Thank you very much. As you said, fading to plan is planning to fade. In the next lecture, we will be discussing about how to improve the midline approach, which is the workhorse of uh, TKR. So over to Mohan Kumar sir for his uh, lecture. Mohan Kumar sir is the clinical professor and HOD of orthopedics at King's Federal Varna. He did his MBBS and MS Ortho from Calicut. He did his Arthroplasty Fellowship from Vienna, Computer Assistant TK, a total knee fellowship from Germany. And he is the former president of Canada Orthopedic Association. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Rajesh. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> now, how to optimize uh, the midline approach to sorry for screen outcomes. Sorry. Okay. Not audible. Uh, full screen outcomes. Sorry. Slideshow, sir. Slideshow. <laughs> One more, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, put it in slideshow. On the bottom, is ready. Sorry, F5 over there, Madhi. You know, first you press the enable editing, enable editing. That yellow line at the top of the screen, right? I'm on the F5 procedure. I'm on the enable editing. I'm on the warning screen. I'm on the yellow line at the top of the screen. Mohan Kumar, sir. Yes. Sir, slide in the mold of protected view on the garden. Protected view on the garden. Full screen where I have to enable the Sir. Enable now. Yes, that was the one. I think it's a real one. No, no. That is, that is preventing the going to slideshow that mode. That warning 
മഞ്ഞ സ്ട്രിപ്പ് കാണുന്നില്ല ഏറ്റവും മുകളില് അതിന്റെ കൂടെ എനേബിൾ എഡിറ്റിംഗ് പറഞ്ഞിട്ടൊരു ടാബ് കാണാം അതൊന്ന് ക്ലിക്ക് ചെയ്താൽ മതി ഏറ്റവും മുകളിൽ നിന്ന് മൂന്നാമത്തെ വരിയില്ല സാർ സാറിന്റെ കേസർ എവിടെ സാറേ സ്ലൈഡ് ടൂലാണ് സർ നിൽക്കുന്നത് ബാക്ക് എടുത്താൽ മതി എടുത്ത സെഷൻ ബാക്ക് എടുത്താൽ മതി ഫ്രണ്ടിലോട്ടാ പോകുന്നത് സർ ബാക്കിലോട്ട് ബാക്കിലോട്ട് ഓക്കെ ഹൈറ്റ് പ്രസന്റർ വ്യൂ ഒന്ന് അടിച്ചു നോക്കാം അതിന്റെ കുറച്ച് റൈറ്റ് ഇല്ല <laughs> 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 എഫ് ഐ അടിച്ചാൽ മതി പറ്റുന്നുണ്ടോ എഫ് ഐ എന്നുള്ള ബട്ടൺ അടിച്ചു കഴിഞ്ഞാൽ ചിലപ്പോ ഡയറക്റ്റ് തോളു ഒന്ന് സാറ് മാഗ്നിഫൈ ചെയ്താൽ മതി ഫുൾ ഫുൾ റൈറ്റ് സൈഡിൽ പൊണ്ടായിട്ട് ചെറുതാക്കിയാൽ മതി ലെഫ്റ്റിലെ സൈഡ്സിൽ വെച്ചാൽ കേസർ വെച്ചിട്ട് ആ അത് ലെഫ്റ്റിലേക്ക് വലിച്ചാൽ മതി ഓക്കെ യാദർശൻ
വേണ്ട സാർ അതിന് വരില്ല ബാക്ക്ലോഡ് അടിച്ചാൽ മതി അല്ല ഇങ്ങനെ തന്നെ പ്രസന്റ് ചെയ്താൽ മതി സാർ കണ്ടിന്യൂ ചെയ്താൽ മതി ബാക്ക്ലോഡ് അടിച്ചാൽ മതി ഫസ്റ്റ് സ്ലൈഡിൽ പോകാൻ ബാക്ക്ലോഡ് അടിച്ചാൽ മതി sorry about it <clears throat> so how to optimize the exposure through the uh, anterior midline incision we are talking സർ സ്റ്റാർട്ട് പ്രസന്റിങ് സർ കുഴപ്പമില്ല സർ ആ കാണാം കാണാം സർ പ്ലീസ് പ്രസന്റ് സർ ഇങ്ങനെ വെച്ച് പ്രസന്റ് ചെയ്താൽ മതി സർ സർ ഇങ്ങനെ അങ്ങ് പ്രസന്റ് ചെയ്താൽ മതി സർ അനിയൻ സാറേ നെക്സ്റ്റ് പ്രസന്റേഷൻ പോണം നെക്സ്റ്റ് പ്രസന്റേഷൻ I think we'll go for the next presentation. It's almost yes, similar. Sir. Okay, you're done. Okay. One more, sir. Ready or not, sir? Ready or not? Ready or not? Yes, sir. You're going to do that. You're going to do that, sir. One more, sir. You're going to do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We can all see. Continue, sir. okay thank you so how to optimize the midline anterior approach um for a the, the, for an ideal exposure there should be adequate visualization and uh, if necessary the incision should be convertible to an extensile one so if you do the midline approach it is a universal approach used for primary as well as the revision take care the problem is that uh, most of the time you may have to injure the infrapatellar branch of the sagittal nerve because the infrapatellar branch of the sagittal nerve is uh, having one of the most amount of uh, anatomical variations so unlikely that uh, you will be every time able to save the uh, branches of this nerve and sometimes for some people this can produce a lot of uh, irritation and uh, pain and sometimes uh, neurodermatitis which can present as sort of uh, eczema on the anterolateral aspect of the upper uh, upper leg but uh, with time it will settle down so the coming to the blood supply the uh, blood supply to the anterior part of the uh, skin of the knee gets uh, is derived from the sacral artery that is the branch of the descending auricular artery which forms a plexus there is an anastomosis in the subcutaneous plane and there are perforating vessels which pass through the subcutaneous plane into the skin so the main blood supply is coming from the medial side since the perforations are passing from the subcutaneous plane to the skin always uh, take a you have to keep the resection underneath the the fascia that is you have to take care fascia between is flat not to avoid skin necrosis and skin problems so the medial parapetal arthrotomy is the standard one very occasionally you uh, go for a lateral parapetal arthrotomy in cases of uh, rare uh, deformities uh, which are uh, fixed valgus knee so the proximal and uh, distal extensions of this incision are useful in uh, primary tk 
you can use either the medial parapetlar approach or the lateral parapetlar approach very rarely you can go for the uh, mid vastus approach the sub vastus approach as well as the minimally uh, invasive surgery for uh, complex and uh, revision cases uh, you have to uh, go for the standard medial parapetlar approach you may have to go uh, resort to a uh, quadriceps snip or a VY turn down or tibial tuberculosteotomy. So coming to incision, the anatomical landmarks should be marked with a marking pen and for that the knee, the knee should be kept flexed because uh, if you put the incision or mark the incision in the extended position, during flexion, the skin or the tibial tuberosity moves laterally. So if you put, even if you put the distal part of the incision or medial, it will become lateral and if the patient kneels, it will be directly on, over the scar. The length of the incision depends on the size of the patient, the preoperative deformity, soft tissue, the thickness and the required exposure. So the standard medial parapetal approach is uh, familiar for uh, most orthopedic surgeons. It is an excellent exposure even in challenging cases. The tips are, uh, you should uh, keep a uh, three to five millimeters of uh, the tendon on the medial side. You should not incise through the muscle, that is the VMO. You have to keep a small sleeve of the tendon attached to the muscle because uh, muscle to tendon suturing uh, may not be uh, as functional as a tendon to tendon repair. So you have to incise through the tendon. And so also you have to keep a uh, medial sleeve of uh, retinaculum on the medial side of the patella. And uh, below also you have to keep a soft tissue sleeve for that, uh, so that the suturing back is uh, made easy. Regarding patella eversion, uh, many surgeons uh, advocate only a patella subluxation laterally and the eversion may sometimes uh, can lead to uh, more post-operative pain and uh, uh, sometimes uh, fibers of the ligamentum patellae. So also the excision of the infrapatellar fat pad should be minimal. At least two-third of the fat pad should be retained. One-third you can remove because the, the posterior part of the fat pad will be fibrotic and uh, you may have to remove it for everything patella or even suppressing it. When you remove too much of fat from the retropatellar area, it may result in fibrosis and uh, uh, it, it has been found that up to 5% of the tendon length may be lost subsequently and uh, sometimes you will lose flexion also in the long run. When you do the medial parapatellar approach and if you require a lateral release for aligning the patella, you have to be doubly careful because you are already compromising the blood supply from the medial side and uh, you will be putting another incision on the lateral side so the patella may become totally evascular. So that has to be taken care of. For the indications for the subvastus and uh, mid, uh, midvastus uh, approach, in the midvastus approach, you are going, splitting the vastus medialis muscle and we're going through it. And in the subvastus approach, you raise it from the medial intervascular septum so that you don't disturb the insertion of the vastus medialis. That is the greatest advantage of this approach. But there are, uh, you cannot do it uh, for every case. There are uh, certain indications for uh, doing this. One, one is that you have to be really familiar with it. Second thing, the patient should be very lean. The deformity should not be severe. And uh, in cases of revision, take care when the quadriceps is too much bulky, when there is a display of a previous HTO and in obese patients, uh, in all these patients, you have to avoid the subvastus as well as the uh, midvastus approach. So in fixed valgus, there are some surgeons who are particular to go through the lateral side because the deformity is on the lateral side, the contracture is on the lateral side. So they say, or they feel that uh, the tackling of the problem on the lateral side is much easier if you do a lateral parapetal arthrotomy. 
but uh, the problem is uh, you will find it difficult to uh, dislocate the patella because the patella to dislocate it medially is very difficult and uh, especially when the patient is uh, uh, has undergone some previous surgery and all this is not at all uh, advocated when the patient is obese or uh, your exposure is uh, difficult then you may have to resort to a rectus snip that is uh, the, at least 10 cm above the superior pelvic patella you may have to make a oblique 45 degree cut into the uh, quadriceps tendon and uh, you have to reach the uh, vastus lateralis so th that will release the uh, quadriceps mechanism completely and you will be uh, able to tackle difficult cases you have to do a repair at the end but the post operative protocol doesn't change at all when there are multiple incisions longitudinal incisions or parallel incisions then you probably the better idea is to choose the lateral one go through the uh, the most lateral incision because uh, the uh, the blood supply is coming mainly from the medial side if there is a transverse incision like an old uh, uh, patella repair or something then it is better to bisect that incision at uh, right angle ensure that there is a adequate skin bridge the post ischio cases especially those patients who have undergone the conventional coventry osteotomy the osteotomy will be passing above the tibial tuberosity and hence there will be a patella baja so the infrapatellar release is performed carefully in a stepwise manner in order to prevent the patellar tendon injury if it is still difficult you may have to go in for a lateral you have to do an early lateral retinacular release and the patellar femoral ligament should be removed and uh, you can resort to a rectus snip give a plaster of the particles uh, or a patellar uh, tto sorry a TTO, that is a tibial to grow strategy. So, V-way turndown is a rarely, uh, it's a rarely performed procedure. It is useful when there is a participant contracture. The advantage is that it allows extra, excellent exposure, allows a lengthening of the participants, preserves the patellar tendon and the tibial tubercle, but the disadvantage is that there is a may affect the participant's strength. The knee needs may need to be Immobilized. So, TTO, this is just for uh, the completion sake uh, because uh, the normally does it for a primary T care, especially should not be attempted by the beginners. The advantage is that uh, it gives uh, excellent exposure, the words uh, exposure lag seen with the VA turn down, and the words what is weakness. The advantage is that some students immobilize it. Or limit the weight bearing post operatively, and the tibial tubercle fracture can occur per operatively. There is a high chance of non union, and the wound healing problems are also high with TTO. So this is a small video. So the marking has to be done. This is a medial parapetular arthrotomy. It will release the uh, medial collateral element in the virus knee, which will be very tight.
The post medial corner has to be taken down. ACL has to be resected completely before you try to suppress the knee. It will remove the medial meniscus. Remove the medial osteophyx. So the uh, choice of approach depends on the surgeon preference and uh, familiarity, uh, the presence of uh, prior incisions, degree of deformity, patella, presence of patella baha, obesity. Thank you. Thank you, sir, uh, for covering the entire midline approach and how to extend it if it is needed. Next, we will be going into uh, distal femoral cut. Sir, stop here, Renam, sir. Rajesh sir, Namaki Chiyam Bajju. So I'll be dealing with the distal femoral cut. So these are the aims of the patient. Patient wants relief of pain, correction of deformity. He wants good range of movement, stable knee, and he wants a long-term survival of the TKR. For this, the surgeon has to achieve the mechanical tibia for one angle. It should be uh, within three degrees of 180. We should restore the joint line. We should balance the soft tissues, equalize the flexion and extension gap, and restore the patellofemoral alignment and mechanics. At the distal femur, we should achieve correct alignment in the sagittal, coronal, and axial planes. We should restore the joint line. We should appropriately size the distal femur. The correct position of the femoral component will be 5 to 7 degrees of valgus angulation in the coronal plane. In the sagittal plane, the flexion should not be more than 10 degree. It should be ideally between 0 to 10 degree. And in the axial plane, it, the distal femoral, uh, the femoral component should be in 3 to 4 degrees of external rotation. In the femoral uh, distal femur, we have to take multiple cuts. One is the distal femoral cut, then the posterior femoral cut, anterior femoral cut, chamfer cuts, and notch cuts. Distal femoral cut determines the thickness of bone removal. It also determines the coronal alignment of the prosthetic knee, and it will also uh, determine the sagittal alignment. The distal femoral cut it affects the thickness, it affects only the extension gap. And the principle is whatever bone we resect, it should be equal to the thickness of the femoral component. Usually it will be about nine millimeters from the normal femoral component. There can be errors in the uh, thickness of the cut. This can either lead to elevation or depression of the joint line. If the extension gap is uh, too tight or loose, it can lead to problems. If the 
over resection is done what it ha what happens is the excision gap will become loose and that may lead to a recurvator deformity if the cut is less or if the thickness is less it may lead to tightness of the extension gap and it can lead to a fixed flexion deformity if the joint line is elevated it can lead to multiple problems like anterior knee pain it can decrease the range of movement it can lead to patella baja it can lead to mid uh, mid flexion instability it may also lead to patella uh, patella tendon impingement and this may result in accelerated wear and uh, lead to early failure of the tk one question is how much of valgus should be cut so we will just go into little bit about the uh, alignment already this has been discussed so first thing you do is you draw the mechanical axis then you draw the joint alignment line then you measure the mechanical lateral femoral uh, distal femoral angle and then you uh, draw the anatomical axis you uh, measure the anatomic lateral distal femoral angle normal anatomical lateral distal femoral angle is about 81 degrees and with relation to mechanical axis the distal femur will be almost about uh, 3 degrees of valgus so that will be about 87 degrees and medial tibia it will be in uh, again it will be in 3 degree varus so distal femur has 3 degree valgus and the proximal tibia has a 3 degree varus for the restoration of the coronal alignment there are multiple methods that is described classical method is the insal neutral mechanical axis method then you have the hunger for traco anatomic method kinematic method and the functional alignment hunger for uh, method in the normal knee if you look at the joint line it is about 3d in about 3 degree varus so in this method the tibial cut also will be taken in 3 degree varus so that we can restore the no uh, normal anatomical alignment of the native knee and the uh, distal femur also will be cut in 3 degree valgus so overall the joint line will be parallel to the ground but the main problem is if you over resect the tibia it may lead to varus mal malposition and this can lead to rapid failure if the varus is more than 5 degrees in the tibia so in the insal uh, neutral mechanical axis method what is done is the tibial cut is done exactly perpendicular to the mechanical axis so when you do this you are actually creating 3 degrees of valgus so femoral uh, cut should be in 3 degree less degree of valgus so in order to do that when you are passing the uh, alignment rod you are actually putting it along the mechanical axis of the femur so it will be cut in about 5 to 6 degrees of valgus so after this what you are actually doing is instead of the normal anatomic uh, lateral distal femoral angle of 84 degrees you are uh, 81 degrees you are actually creating an 84 degree angle and in the mechanical lbfa what you are creating is 90 degree instead of 87 degrees so overall the joint line will be parallel to the ground this also uh, needs to be taken into account when you are, are doing the posterior femoral cut so because the tibia is cut in 3 degree valgus you have to externally rotate the distal uh, the posterior femoral cut by about 3 degree uh, external rotation this is to account for the 3 degree tibial valgus cut that uh, the, all the tibial cuts will affect the extension gap as well as the flexion gap so in order to uh, address this in the flexion gap you have to do a 3 degree external rotation in the coronal pain there can be multiple uh, errors so this can be due to a wrong entry point so normal uh, in a uh, in vast majority of knee the entry point should be about 7 to 10 degrees of uh, anterior to the attachment of the pcl and it should be medial to the white side line but ideally you should draw it in each and every patient and see what the patient's individual anatomy is if the entry point is too anterior you can put the the silver wall process in hyperextension if it is too posterior it can lead to flexion if it is too medial it can lead to a varus malposition if it is too lateral it can lead to a valgus malposition in the sagittal plane also there can be errors 
So normally the distal femoral cut should be in about zero to 10 degrees of flexion. But if the cut is like this, it can lead to a flexion malposition. And if the uh, distal femoral cut is an extension, it can lead to notching of the distal femur. What are the solutions? One is you can widen the entry point so that even if there is some error when you are doing this, there will be uh, it will get corrected when you uh, put the alignment rod. Second is, as uh, Shigaravadi Velisar said, you have to use a long intramedullary rod and it should reach the isthmus. Then only it will be uh, stable and uh, intraoperatively all the cuts will be in the normal plane. Next is, whenever you are taking the cut, I always say that you have to check twice and cut once so that you can use multiple alignment methods to uh, see the alignment. So if you are looking from the side, the alignment rod should be parallel to the femur. And if you are uh, looking from the top, the alignment should be parallel to the mechanical. It should be in the mechanical axis of the femur. And the alignment rod, it should be over the center of the uh, femoral head. This will uh, ensure that the uh, cut over the distal uh, femur is perpendicular to the mechanical axis. The AP cut will determine the femoral size. It will also determine the femoral component rotation. It will also determine the flexion gap and the petla tracking. So your sizing should be uh, correct. If you undersize, what happens is you will be removing a lot of excess bone. If you oversize, what happens is usually it will lead to stuffing of either the uh, petlofemoral joint or the uh, it can lead to stuffing of the flexion gap. So sizing should be appropriate. In a posterior reference system, if the uh, undersizing is done, it may lead to monarchy. So whenever you do an upsizing, what happens is you will be putting a larger processes. This will lead to uh, tightening of the flexion gap. And as I said earlier, it can lead to overstuffing of the petlofemoral joint. If you downsize, when you are putting the smaller processes, what can happen is it can lead to anterior notching. And if the flexion gap is unstable, it can lead to flexion instability. And excessive femoral bone resection also can happen if you do a downsizing. The solutions, one is uh, whenever you are do so doing the sizing, you have to make sure that the uh, tip of the jig, it is actually touching the femoral condyle. If it is pressing on the soft tissue, that may lead to uh, oversizing. So you have to make sure that you remove adequate amount of soft tissue from the anterolateral part of the uh, distal femur so that your jig will be touching on the uh, distal femur. And you have to assess multiple methods that is available with the jig, distal femoral jig, to ensure that you are putting the correct size. The common dictum is when you are using a CR, you can downsize. And if you are using a P PS, if the size is in between, you can go for a upsizing. Coming to the posterior cut, this has to be done uh, in an external rotation of about three degrees if you are using the conventional insal method. And this can be decided either by the measured resection technique of insal or by the gap balancing technique. And that will be dealt with in the next lecture by Dr. Vijay Mohan. In conclusion, you have to do a preoperative planning. See where your entry point for the distal femoral jig uh, rod is. You have to make sure that the entry point is made correctly. And you have to use a long intramedullary uh, rod. And you have to use correct uh, thickness. Then you have to make sure that all the alignment in all three planes is adequate. Then only you will be able to achieve a balanced uh, total knee arthroplasty. Thank you very much. Next lecture will be delivered by Dr. Vijay Mohan. He is the uh, senior consultant and lead surgeon.
at Asher uh, Medicity Kochi. He did his MBBS and MS from Trivandrum Medical College. He worked at Bishop ben Benazir Hospital at Kollam and Regional Cancer Center and also at Amrita. He joined Astra Medicity in 2012-13. He has undergone hands-on training in various centers across the globe, including Belgium, Germany, Bangkok, and other places. Over to you, uh, Dr. Vijay. Thank you, Rajesh. Uh, thank you, the organizers and the executive committee of uh, ISSCON for inviting me. Uh, I am uh, still uh, your desktop is coming. Can you unshare it? Rajesh, probably you have to stop sharing. I'm unable to stop sharing. I'm not seeing the... I will just leave and come back, I think. Yeah, yeah. Can you share now? No, still. I mean, can you can you try unsharing it? Mm, I I have, I have I, I unshared that. I think. Yeah, but still, I try to share. I am seeing that iPhone whiteboard, and I think it's sagacious. Yeah. No, you have started sharing again. Unshare again. Yeah, that's what I I I. No, it's okay. No. Still, now I shared mine. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay yeah. No, no, it's right, yeah. Is the slides visible now? Yes, visible. Okay, thank you. So basically, my uh, topic of discussion is uh, gap balancing versus uh, measure to section. We have just covered uh, the pre-op planning and uh, the, how to open the knee and uh, what are the basic alignments we should look at and how we need to get a proper alignment. Uh, essentially, you are converting round-on-round uh, -round normal knee to a convex-on concave uh, abnormal knee, that's artificial knee. So how to, how to achieve that, like whichever you have planned in paper, how to achieve that in real is the question. So there are basically two ways of doing it. That is, one is gap balancing and measured resection. I am sure the differentiation between these two is uh, getting like uh, narrower and narrower now. And with uh, the uh, new technologies like uh, computer navigation and uh, robotics, uh, I think like a new set of uh, uh, things will be defined soon. But uh, right now, when we are using a jig based uh, total knee replacement, still there are two ways of uh, achieving it. One is gap balancing and measured resection. So if you ask me like which is better or which has got more advantages or which, which is more disadvantages, then I would say uh, which is better, a BMW 7 series or a, a S series of Merc. So it, it's basically based on the customer's preference, like those who wish to be, uh, drive their own cars, they will go for a BMW. And those who wish to sit on the back and have a chauffeur driven car, they go for uh, a Benz. And uh, essentially, both are two good cars and essentially both will do a good job. So why this uh, difference of uh, two methods came? If you look at uh, the history of total knee replacement, the initial probably a proper technological description uh, was done by Freeman and Minsal in 1970. And uh, the first description they did was a gap balancing method with a flexion gap creating first. That was the initial thought. So essentially, it was called classical alignment, as Rajesh has mentioned in his slides. It's basically make a perpendicular tibial cut to make sure that uh, the equal load is dis distributed. 
then you make a sufficient distal femoral resection to balance the gaps. So this is essentially the uh, basic uh, uh, principle of this technique, what they have described. But somehow, maybe you should remember that it's happened in 1970. Like you have only one size tibia, and that way monoblock tibia, and two size femur, no left and right, no proper instrumentation. So a lot of surgeons like find it difficult to understand this principle and uh, like uh, reproduce uh, pro proper alignment, probably. I'm guessing in that way. So 10 years down the line, uh, David Hungerford Kenna, and Krakow came with the new uh, description of measured bone cuts, which which they made very simple, but their basic uh, things, were, it's called anatomical alignment, but basic principles were again same. They make a perpendicular TBL cut for distribution of equal load and a sufficient distal formation. This remains same, but in this, they have designed that 3-degree varus TBL cut and 9-degree valgus femoral cut, 9-degree slope in CR knees and so many things like which already dealt in the previous topics. So I always uh, compare uh, these technologies with uh, uh, the computer technologies we have. Essentially, we have the Apple and the Windows. There are two major things you have. If you look at the market value, the Apple constitutes about maybe 20 to 30% and Windows constitute about 70 to 80% of the world market share. It's very interesting to see that the first... Uh, Steve Jobs started uh, Apple company in 1976, like the insults uh, started... Uh, the gap balance technique in 1970s and 10 years down the line, the Windows first operating uh, system was launched in 1985, just like the David Hungerford uh, like came up with uh, the measured resection cut uh, 10 years down the line. But now we know like 80% of the surgeons like or 80% of the companies and the implants and instrumentations like go into a measured resection and maybe a very few companies and a couple of implants are available for gap balancing. But still a lot of surgeons prefer to do gap balancing like a lot of uh, people used to the, uh, prefer to do Apple phone, even though they are minority. So what is essentially the difference is, the measure resection is very simple. Like based on the implant, like you are going to replace, you, you make cuts, you remove the bone and fix the implant and do a little soft tissue, soft tissue releasing to make uh, the flexion and extension gap balanced. So there's nothing, it's like a windows, like it's a menu operated thing. You just do very simple things, cut open everything, remove some bones and replace it with metal and plastic. But in gap balancing, like it's entirely a different philosophy. If you were one goes from A to Z and other go from Z to A. So you are essentially making a tibial cut first and based on the tibial cut and ligament balancing, you are making a flexion gap first. And once you create a flexion gap, you reproduce the same extension gap by adjusting the femur cut. And here, like in measured resection, you see you have a fixed three degree external rotation to compensate for the 87 degree virus in the tibia. But here in flexion uh, gap balancing technique, you are creating a perpendicular cut and balancing the flexion first. And based on that, there you are de deciding on the femoral rotation. There is no fixed femoral rotation there. And uh, if you look at uh, the how to do it, like, like the measured resection gives you an ample freedom. If you want to do the tibia first, you can do the tibia first. If you want to do the femur first and finish off all cuts and then come to tibia, okay. A lot of, lot of surgeons prefer to finish off femur first and then come back, come back to tibia. But if you look at uh, the gap balancing technique, you have to do the tibia first. Like all your cuts, your rotations, your alignment is based on your tibial balance. So you have to be very perfect in your tibial cut. If you go wrong in this one particular place, you go wrong in all steps. But in measured resection, like each step, you have a provision of correction. So that maybe that is the reason why the measured resection uh, became like a more uh, like uh, popular and a lot of people went in for it. So essentially, if you compare these two, the measured resection, you put back what you have resected and you do the extension gap first. And based on that, you make the flexion gap and you like make uh, like releases and adjust both. And the tibial and femoral cuts are independent. And there's a fixed femoral rotation based on usually it's three, it's three degrees maybe in valgus and those things, maybe you increase it. And the balance, the gap between soft tissue releases. But if you look at the gap balancing, resect only what is needed. You are not uh, like free to resect what you want. So the flexion gap is created first. Tibial and femoral cuts are dependent. The femoral rotation is dependent on the tibial long axis. Like you, have, you do not have any, any choice there. And the cuts are decided based on the ligament tension. These are essential uh, difference in features between these two. And uh, now uh, we look into the, like, the pitfalls of each. Like if you look at the pitfalls of measured resection, 
this paper uh, studied about the femoral rotation alignment. Three degree external rotation is the most unreliable uh, thing you can reproduce in a, a TKR practically because of doubtful dependability of bony lamp. It's already explained in one of the previous talks, like because you have wider area, like and when you palpate, like you can you can go wrong in any way. So one degree, two degree here, this way and that way can easily happen. And uh, because of that, you can finally you can end up in maybe internal rotation of the femur or an increased external rotation uh, and giving you a asymmetrical gap. And another thing that studies have shown that if you prepare the extension gap first and then go to the flexion gap, the preparation of the flexion gap, especially in chronic knees, when you have a contracted posterior capsule, if you release all these things, automatically the extension gap also increases by 2.1 to 2.7 millimeter. Then you will have to do further like soft tissue adjustments to balance the whole things. So uh, based on these things, like uh, Dennis has, who is a, like uh, an advocate of strong advocate of gap balancing, when to say that measured resection is an outdated technique, but even after like 20 years after he says this measured resection still remains uh, the preferred for the surgeon, that means like maybe he was wrong. And uh, there are studies comparing both gap balance versus measured resection technique for total knee arthroplasty and the rotation of the femoral component using a gap balance technique resulted in better coronal stability, which we suggest will improve functional performance and will reduce polyethylene wear. That was one study. And how precisely the determination of rotational alignment of the femoral process in total knee arthroplasty. I saw because of the variation of geometry and because of the like non-dependability of the bony landmarks, like sometimes like a surgeon can get lost in between. And uh, what are the pitfalls in gap balancing? Again, like there's a difficulty in objectively performed soft tissue releases to balance the gaps. The more, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm still talking about uh, measure resection. The more medial release you do, there's a, do the chance of femur like getting external rotate. And, and when you do, do eyeballing, you maybe you naturally you tend to more keep less at the external rotator, the femur, and it can go in for internal rotation of femur. And what are the difficulties or pitfalls in joint elevation? Joint elevation in, in gap balancing, basically it's a, there's no control on joint elevation. In measured resection, you can actually accurately reproduce the joint elevation, which has in turn will like uh, uh, result in a better patellar tracking and stability. But in, in gap balancing, you are essentially depending on the tension of the tissues. And so you, your, your gap balancing, your joint line may vary. And there is a non-anatomical femur. You do not, do not have any control over the anatomical rotation of the femur because it goes automatically with uh, the TBL perpendicular axis. And uh, the studies have shown that in gap balancing, you tend to have increased distal and posterior femoral resection. Because again, it's based on like the tight knee. Uh, when you do the flexion gap creation first, you may tend to like cut less. And when, you, when it is cut less, you cut less in the extension gap also. But in the lax knee, uh, because you cut, tend to cut more on when creating the flexion gap, and that you have to reproduce same on extension gap, you tend to cut more, more bone. So you do, do not have any control over that. And uh, the comparative studies have shown that a restoration of mechanical alignment happens uh, better in gap balancing. And the femoral rotation alignment, there is a tendency to go for increased external rotation in gap balancing than uh, measured resection. And of course, the joint line, there is always, there is a problem of elevated joint line coming in gap balancing. And the extension gap is the one thing which seems to be same in like whether you do a gap balancing or muscle resection, and ultimately you end up in same. And uh, uh, flexion gap also, like there is no, there's no difference in flexion gap also. And the lift off, there is no, there is no difference in gap balancing or muscle resection. It basically depends on your soft tissue releases. And uh, there is a study which compared the knee score and it has come out that uh, two years, it is slightly better than gap balancing, but in long-term results, it's, it's same for both. So what now, like, as you said, like now, if you look at any instrumentation, you have, uh, once you are like, like uh, maybe in start with as a junior surgeon, you have to go strictly according to the principles, either you, if you are doing a gap balancing implant and instrument, you go strictly according to that. But if you are doing a measured resection, it goes strictly according to that. But it's like, like a learning bicycle. Once you learn the art of cycling, like you can like do the cycling uh, like without your hands on the handlebar, or you can sit the reverse and do a lot of circuses you can do. Similarly, once you're familiar, so like once you are completed, maybe 
uh, 200 tkrs or 500 tkrs then it becomes an art like you tend to like uh, uh, take something from the have their balance and like you like start forgetting accurate sizing of the femur but you start doing the sizing of the femur based on your balancing or your tissue tension and those a lot a lot a lot of play uh, it becomes an art than than uh, uh, what you call uh, science so hybrid is a more thing that is actually now also like we you know that from the cars also we are going for hybrid cars so that is the future like once you learn uh, a tkr properly then you tend to learn the hybrid thing then which will finally give you like better alignment and better patient satisfaction and you can see like i started with the example of apple and uh, uh, windows which was like completely separated in the beginning but now in windows you can uh, use apple and in apple you can load windows also the same thing in sticker also like uh, the you have to learn from both and get the positives from the both and use it very cautiously and use your common sense to reproduce a better alignment in tkr thank you Dr. Vijay, thank you for the very lucid uh, presentation on uh, measured resection and gap detection. I can see that from your presentation, you are a uh, car fan and a techni- uh, techno geek. Thank you. Next, uh, we will have a uh, presentation on uh, nuances of uh, distal uh, proximal tibial cut. Over to you, Rajneesh. Dr. Rajneesh uh, is the senior consultant of orthopedic surgeon at uh, Baby Bumbaru Hospital, Calicut. He is the second unit chief. He is uh, formerly associate professor of NES Medical College, Tirunelvanna. He did this MBBS and DMD from Calicut Medical College. Uh, over to you, Rajneesh. He is a very prolific surgeon. Thank you, sir. Good evening, my friends. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, yes. Slide show. Slide show. Sir, can you all see the slides? Yes. Full screen, I'll come. Yes. Okay, sir. Start here. Okay. My topic for today is nuances of proximal tibial cut. Proximal tibial cut, a decep- though it looks like a deceptively simple step, our primary aim is to get the uh, tibial cut perpendicular to the mechanical axis in coronal plane that is parallel to the uh, ground our tibial cut should be parallel to the tibial uh, ground how to get all this done you have to be very clear about 6 degrees of position freedom which i will be dealing sequentially as we do as we go on doing a tkr so first thing is how to cut the tibia the level of the tibial cut here the aim is to maintain the anatomical joint line replace the exact amount of removed bone with prosthesis what happens if you cut more that leads to distalization of the joint line patella alta all this happens when you do a gap balancing because you you cut the tibia more so you have to adjust that cut with the femur so there's a chance that you can go for a distalization of the joint line then there can be only smaller cross section of area of bone will be available for comedian positioning as the tibia the cross section is like a cone so as you go further down smaller articular contact area will be there the size of the tibial tray will be small more load will be added to that small area so chances of uh failure in future is there weaker bone will be exp- ex- a weaker bone will be exposed they can be damage to the m- medial collateral and the lateral collateral ligaments also similarly what happens if you cut less in gap balancing technique if it is used it can co- cause excessive tibial femoral resection upward migration of the joint line which may lead to patella baja if you are using a measured resection that may lead to tightness of flexion and extension so all these things should be taken care of how to get away with minimum thickness poly 
Usual technique is to cut a 2 mm from the most affected side. My preferred technique is get the distal femoral cut first. Excision of all the overhanging osteophyte that may stretch the capsule and the collaterals. Apply a manual traction in extension. Use the proper thickness spacer because the spacer can be small, large, or medium sized enough. You know? So, according to that puff only, you get the spacer and you mark on the tibia using a using a cautery or a so means or, or a um, osteotom. Okay, this is how it is done. This is uh, this is a spacer here. The, uh, this, uh, the, this area is a anterior, tip, anterior femoral cut. The uh, distal femoral cut has been done. You place it close to it and then mark here with a cautery or a osteotum. You can align the jig then with the angel wing. You keep it there, mark it and then cut the tibia perpendicular to the mechanical axis in the coronal plane or that is cut parallel to the ground. If there is any cavity or uh, is there, you can build up that with the cement, screws, bone cement or augments. Once that cut is done, you can see two identical rectangles, one in flexion and one in extension that balances the knee in flexion and extension. That is the most important part in total knee replacement, getting the soft tissue balance and proper rectangular cuts, one inflection and extension. What is the role of tibial cut in balancing the tibial in balancing the cap? The proximal tibial surface is a common contact point in flexion as well as in extension. So it affects both the extension gap and the flexion gap equally. Coming to the next degree of positional freedom. That is a virus or the valgus. You should be cutting it parallel to the ground. That creates, determines the axial alignment of the knee in balancing the forces in weight bearing. The stability of the whole construct depends on that. There are two techniques. One is the inframedullary technique and the other is an extramedullary technique. The, usually we go ahead with extramedullary guide technique, most commonly used because all the references points are exterior, like the tibial tubercle, the crust of the tibia, then the two malleoli. So you align the jig approximately between the medial one third and the lateral two third of the tibial tubercle, along the tibial crust parallel to the fibula and just medial to the midpoint of the midpoint between the two malleoli because the center of the angle mortis is just me medial. You should be taking care that the reflected patella tendon won't come its way. In the case of an intramedullary guide, most of the time it may create a problem as the tibia may have, the tibial shaft may have old fractures or, or the tibia vara. Or in the case of valgus knee, there is more chance of tibial bowing approximately 66 percent. In some medullary, in some cases, the medullary cavity also will be too narrow to pass the intramedullary road. Proximal entry point should be very accurate, not possible if the tibial surface requires an offset. So both are equally good, but the, you have to choose the patients correctly. So you have to have a thorough knowledge, a clinical uh, judgment of your patient preoperatively and you should be reading the x-ray very well. There's no literature support as such to say one is superior to the other. Now coming to the third degree, third degree of the positional freedom, that is the flexion and extension, that is a posterior tibial slope. The, the basic principle is always cut it in flexion, that is give a little bit of posterior slope. How much? In a normal knee, you can see that posterior tibial slope is approximately 10 degrees. But if you add the meniscus 
there, it comes to around 3 degrees. Advantage, it reduces the shear stress during flexion when compressive forces is more. But the disadvantage is shear, it reduces the shear stress in full flexion, in full extension. If no posterior tibial slope, the tibial component subsidence is more likely as the anterior cortex is weaker when compared to the posterior cortex. So approximately third degree, three degree of posterior slope is always welcoming. You should be very thorough with the implants you are using. Why? Because some the slope will be inbuilt. In those cases, the tibia can be resected at 90 degree. If there is no inbuilt slope, you have to give the slope. So how to understand that? Look at the uh, tibial insert or even the, the trial insert. If the thickness are equal anteriorly and posteriorly, that means you have to give the slope. If there is no slope inbuilt. If there is a thickness difference between anterior and posterior, that means there is an inbuilt slope for the insert. What happens when you give a post excessive posterior slope? If you if you are going to do a CR knee, if you increase the posterior slope, that may cut the PCL and you will have to convert to post, uh, P, P, PS knees. In PS knees, if you give more, that can lead to a posterior tibiofemoral subluxation and increase if there is an increased flexion gap. May result in valgus deformity if you cut the P or L or the posterior oblique ligament. That means if when you give more posterior slope, there is a chance the posterior ligaments can get injured. When you are determined to give a posterior slope, you should make sure that it is not given at an angle. If you give postromed, if you give a postromedial slope, that knee will go for a virus. If you give a postrolateral slope, you it may lead to a valgus knee as you see here. What happens if you give inadequate posterior slope? That can result to an anterior subsidence because the quality of the anterior cancellous pore decreases rapidly as one progresses downward below the joint line. Under no circumstances should tibia be cut with an upward slope. The effect of posterior slope in sagittal deformities is if there is a fixed flexion deformity, <laughs> You decrease the posterior slope, can increase extension. If you increase the posterior slope, you can increase flexion also. But always keep in mind that the fixed flexion deformity is multifactorial. You have to take care of all the things to correct it. Coming to the fourth, deg fourth degree of positional freedom, there are the rotations, internal rotation and the external rotation. The component can go for an internal or external rotation if you don't uh, create a pop, if you don't do uh, the keel work properly. What happens if you go for an internal rotation? If you create an internal rotation, there will be a patella mile tracking. The Q angle will increase and that can lead to a patella instability, even subluxations. You can see here what happens. How to get away with a proper external rotation means proper positioning of the you know, uh, tibial tray. The tibial tuberosity is approximately 15 to 18 degree in external rotation. So align the, the tibial tray along the medial one third and the lateral two third of the tibial tubercle. Always take care that the patient has not had any corrective osteotomies or realignment procedures. How to assess this rotation? How to make it happen? You cut the femur, you put the uh, trial component, then you have cut the tibia, that uh, proximal tibial cut has been taken, you insert the tibial components and the uh, polyethylene liner. Then take it from flexion to extension two, three times. That will, the whole in construct will come into place. You can mark it. There are two, uh, there will be two markings. You can mark it. Here you can see in some jig, there's only, in some jig, there's only one marking. In other jig, there will be two marking. 
so you can mark it here that will give you a proper rotation of that implant to that knee but make sure that it is always between medial one third and the lateral two third giving adequate external rotation other clinical method to assess the rotation sum mark the component position in the uh, other anatomical landmarks to assess the rotation sum the position of the um, tray with the second tray most commonly used method but what i prefer prefer is transverse axis of the tibia plat tibial plateau along with the transmalleolar axis that is specific for that is specific and different for each patient tibia so i prefer uh, i prefer to take these two landmark but the take home point is no single anatomical landmark can be used exclusively use two or more of the above to confirm the positioning coming to the four, fifth and the sixth degrees of uh, freedom positional freedom they are the medial lateral and the anterior posterior positioning of the tibial tray on the uh on the proximal tibial cut the goal is to maximize the proximal tibial coverage and minimize the overhang why because if you to create a overhang these things will be irritating the soft tissues as well as the tendons and uh, ligaments where or you can accept the overhand why this concept has come because there for each femur size there usually will be one size below equal size and one size above tibia but sometimes this won't be adequate to position the tibial tray adequately on the cortices the actually ideally the uh, the tibial tray should be seating on the cortex so that you can avoid the subsidence in future medial side if you if there is a overhang they can irritate the mcl so it is not advisable for a overhang if ever you want to give some overhang it is on the lateral side because fcl is attached to the fibula head ideally should be avoided posterior lateral also ideally it is better to avoid because there is a popliteus tendon but if no other way you can have a little bit overhang there because the tibial tray will be left in external rotation never posterior medially it may rotate the whole uh, tibial tray internal rotation they can be patella malpracking if there is a po anterior posterior mismatch the post posterior positioning of the component is recommended because if you take it anteriorly there is a chance of subsidence cancellous anterior bone what is my preferred technique how to get it done use the intramedullary uh, row technique whenever be feasible you put the canal finder centralize it pass a thin intramedullary row centralize the tibial base plate jig over the row uh, excision of all the ossified should be done before doing all this you can see this you can centralize it put the medial pin first then make sure that the whole tray of adequate size as you can have trays one size above equal size and one size below usually sometimes there will can be more also and the whole thing should be seating on the cortex this chart will help you to uh, adjust all the problems where it which occurs during tkr this this chart ideally should be there inside each theater because at times you may lose your cool and things may happen so this will help you to correct all your problems like tight inflection all this you can have a photo of this and it is easily available in net so in short how to get your tibial tibial cut right minimum bone cut should be there and maintain the natural joint line avoid varus valgus in coronal plane ensure adequate posterior slope proper rotation of the tibial component avoid overhang last but not the least never hesitate to use cr whenever necessary helps us to assess your work on table improves your precision and perfection 
Thank you for your kind attention. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, therefore, is not an act, but a habit. Thank you. Thank you, Rajneesh, for the very nice talk on the deal cut. As you said, even though it appears to be very simple, it has actually a lot of things to understand. But only you can uh, do, especially in revision cases and in complex primary geometries. Next, we will be having a uh, lecture by uh, Dr. Danshegar Raja. He is consultant, joint replacement surgeon at Ganga Hospital. He joined Ganga Hospital in 2002. He did the fellowship in arthroplasty from Adelaide and Sydney, Australia. And from he has done a fellowship from Hospital for Special Surgery, New York. He has a special interest in primary and prevention arthroplasty. He also uh, has a, uh, it's a qualified uh, degree in uh, tissue banking. He did this DNB from Yoga Hospital, did this MBBS from Coimbatore, and he did this uh, D Ortho from Stanley Medical College. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Professor Rajesh, for the introduction and uh, my respect and regards for the president of uh, OSS, uh, Professor Selvaraj, uh, Dr., uh, the Secretary General, Dr. Amin Nambikuti, <coughs> the office bearers of Calicut Orthopedic Association and KOA. Thank you for the opportunity. <coughs> so I'm going to talk about uh, petalar resurfacing, when, I, when, when and how I do the petalar resurfacing. So any patient with the knee pain, the standard X-ray is uh, weight-bearing AP, lateral and a skyline. Skyline view is a must because we can diagnose a lot of uh, petalofemoral problems which can be missed otherwise if you take only AP and lateral view. So for all postgraduates, <coughs> it's always better to take a skyline view for all your uh, patients with the knee problem. So the topic is controversial whether to uh, resurface the petal or not to resurface. The whole orthopedic community is deeply divided. There are equal number of studies favoring both of these procedures. There are four uh, key questions. First is, can resurfacing improve petalofemoral performance and function? Example, like uh, star climbing ability. Can it provide a reduction in the incidence of anterior knee pain? Can it enhance patient's overall satisfaction? And is it cost effective? So these are four questions generally we need to address when you're addressing the petala. Basically, there are three treatment strategies, always to resurface, and never to resurface and selectively re resurface. So I moved from never to resurface to always resurface. Now I'm doing selective resurfacing. So pros of petal are resurfacing, a reduced incidence of post-operative anterior knee pain, avoidance of secondary resurfacing, high patient satisfaction, better overall function, low complication rate, and relatively inexpensive or not time consuming. <clears throat> this you have, you have been doing a routinely uh, resurfacing in the petala doesn't take much of your uh, time and uh, if you do it effectively there are very low complication rate so there is about the petala resurfacing and the uh, cons of petala resurfacing sometimes if you have a very thin petala and you try to resurface you can have a fracture uh, you can have a avascular necrosis because you are meddling around the uh, blood supply now, sometimes the PS knees, you can have a petalofemoral clunk when you resurface the petala. That could be petalar loosening and sometimes instability if the tracking is not okay. The pros for petalar retention, it shortens your operative time. It preserves the host bone so that there is good uh, levoram mechanism. It reduces chance of osteonecrosis, more physiological kinematics, ability to withstand high petalofemoral forces without concern of wear. Ease of resurfacing in case of recurrent uh, anterior knee pain. If the patient subsequently develops uh, anterior knee pain, you can always go back and resurface. So these are the things of uh, petalar retention, advantages of petalar retention. So most of us do this step of uh, petaloplasty. We remove all the osteophytes because usually we do total knee replacement for tricompartmental arthritis. We remove the marginal osteophytes and then reshape the petala. And then um, some of us do a thermocoagulation of the surrounding uh, synovium of the petala. So uh, when you come to selective uh, petala resurfacing, these are the indications. So pa patient age less than 65, so younger patient with reasonably good cartilage, we don't resurface. There should not be inflammatory arthritis. So most of my inflammatory arthritis are res resurfaced. Retropetalar cartilage is reasonably well preserved. If I see a pristine intact cartilage, Especially when I use a CR type of implant, I don't resurface. Even with the PS, I don't resurface. 
no significant abnorm, uh, anatomical abnormality. So petrol femoral congruence, there should not be a lateral tilt or lateral shift, abnormal shape, normal petrol femoral uh, mechanics. The pedal attracts centrally when you are doing your trialing and patient does not have anterior knee pain. This is a typical example of uh, you know, petal resurface, uh, non-resurfacing patient, almost like 10 years follow-up, patient is doing well. So the petal is tracking centrally, if you can see the skyline view, and there is no problem with this uh, patient's uh, range of movements, petal of tracking was normal. So the patient is doing well. It's a typical example where I would not uh, resurface where the cartilage was intact and petla is tracking normally, petlofemoral kinematic is normal. So most of our patients have severe tricompartmental arthritis. If you, I see a patient like this with tricompartmental arthritis, anterior uh, petlofemoral arthritis with osteophytes, <coughs> I don't hesitate. I go ahead with the uh, resurfacing. Many of the elderly patients present with a, a joint like this, they have tricompartmental arthritis. They have a lot of changes in the petla. I do resurfacing. So, what are the principles of uh, petalar resurfacing? First is restoration of physiologic uh, petalofemoral spacing, composite thickness. So, we should not increase or decrease the petalar uh, thickness. We increase it leads to overstuffing, decrease uh, leads to loss of uh, petalar lever art mechanism. Re creation of retropetalar high point through correct placement of the petalar implant. So, the petalar is uh, slightly oval. You need to put it slightly proximally so that the high point should be maintained. Restoration of petalofemoral relationship, joint level. Restoration of rotational, rotational alignment of femoral and tibial components. It's very important. There is a mal rotation of tibia or femoral, femoral component. There will be petalar mal tracking. So that has to be addressed. Balancing of the petalofemoral soft tissues. If there is a lateral retinacular tightness, that has to be addressed. So this is a patient with uh, <coughs> trichopartmental osteoarthritis. <laughs> So I usually do the uh, totally replacement with the medial parapetal approach. I've done the femoral and tibial component uh, placement for CC balancing. I do the petalar resurfacing. I use the free hand technique and um, remove the cheeks because they are bulky. So the basic idea is uh, I start removing the lateral petalar, uh, petalar facet. So this is a lateral petalar facet I'm removing. I start from the middle side, but I generally remove the cartilage from the lateral facet. So you cannot put the cement on a cartilage. I just remove enough bone from the lateral facet and then make it level with the middle facet. There is the amount of bone I remove. That's a minimal uh, bone because our petala are very thin, 22 or 20. So I just remove the lateral facet, make it level with the middle facet so that you have a uniform surface to uh, put the petala down. We usually saline, uh, put saline to avoid thermal necrosis. We remove the petlar uh, uh, <coughs> osteophytes and the debris. And then I extend the knee and compare the medial and lateral facet. Right? And generally I feel it with my finger or use a caliper. If both sides are equal, I uh, uh, proceed. Uh, make sure there is no uh, <coughs> uh, I can generally shift the petlar medially so that it helps in uh, tracking properly. So you can see that I'm slightly biasing the uh, uh, implant slightly medially. So instead of keeping it center, I'm biasing it slightly medially. And the uh, long axis of the uh, petala should be perpendicular to the petala tendon. So when you're inverting the petala, uh, the long axis of the petala tendon has to be considered and it should be perpendicular to the long axis of the petala bone. Here I'm using a, a tripec, uh, triple pec uh, petala. So they're putting the trial, it's a uh, oval dome shaped petla. So once you hurt, the petla axis becomes parallel to the femoral component. When, you're, uh, when you reduce it, when you're inverting, it is in a different plane, but you make sure your petla, you put the plane perpendicular to the petla uh, ligament. So 22 is the standard size, we remeasure, avoid overstuffing. We overstuff the joint anterior petla femoral forces are increased and increased where happens. So then we check the tracking with a no thumb technique. You don't uh, uh, place the petala uh, thumb on the petala. It's just allowed to track and just tracking nicely. There's no lift up. 
when we uh, when you are cementing the final components you cement the petal as well is all poly uh, petal i'm cementing the tibia first i use cement on the both sides of the component do final cementing the sequence can change from surgeon to surgeon some surgeons cement the uh, pet, uh, petal and then go to the femur here i'm putting some cement on the petal surface and the already there is some cement on the petal use a clamp to uh, compress and achieve compression at the interface then once the cement sets we again do the uh, trialing i mean checking the petal tracking so once it is okay we'll close it's very important to uh, uh, restore the petal femoral uh, tibial and femoral component rotation uh, to your normal position because if you inter rotate the tibial component or external rotate the femoral component the q angle increases so the normal q angle is around 8 to 12 degrees if you increase the q angle the chance of petal subluxation is high and the petal femoral uh, wear rate is higher so again you should not reduce the thickness of the petal you should restore whatever the pre operative thickness is present so we measure it before cutting and then uh, uh, put back the uh, amount of uh, uh, plastic with the composite thickness of the same level of the pre operative thickness it's not over stuff or under size a petal thickness less than 16 mm is a contraindication for petal resurfacing and basically we also look at the skyline view we classify the petal anatomy into three types it's called a v-box classification type 1 type 2 and type 3 if it is uh, type 1 it is uh, equal facet medial and lateral facet type 2 the lateral facet is slightly bigger medial facet is smaller type 3 is a, a, a very small medial facet so is another example of the uh, mri picture of the different types of petal type 1 2 and 3 type 2 is very common so we based on this uh, assessment of the pre operative petlar characteristics we studied uh, around 250 consecutive total knee replacement uh, patients and the petlar anatomy was studied and the factors predisposing to lateral retinacular release were studied so if you have a valgus knee if there is a type 3 petla or if there is a lateral tilt or lateral shift these four conditions will uh, you need to do a petla resurfacing this was statistically significant so if you have valgus deformity always lateral retinaculum is tight once you uh, do the tkr and balance your knee then if the lateral retinaculum is tight we have to do a lateral retinacular release so valgus deformity so again this is type 1 patella where the both medial and lateral facet are uh, equal in size and this tracking centrally we have intact cartilage i don't resurface if there is a patella femoral arthritis i resurface so type 2 as you can see on the uh, left knee Uh, the image on the right side the medial facet is smaller than the lateral facet and there is slight lateral shift in that situation if you are resurfacing we need to do a lateral release you can see the left side image i have resurfaced in this patient but i had to do a lateral retinacular release and the tracking is central so this is type 3 definitely uh, most of the time you need to have a resurfacing i mean a release done so sometimes you have isolated petal femoral arthritis here there are not much of uh, tibio femoral arthritis Uh, severe petal femoral arthritis is very symptomatic patient is not able uh, able to climb even a single step here we do a, a petal resurfacing uh, dr rajesh manier has uh, described the outside in technique where you don't open the uh, synovium you pre pre preserve the synovium and do a, a release on the outside so it, uh, the release is classified into uh, level 1 level 2 and level 3 Level is level is below the uh, inferior pole of petal. Level two is uh, up to the superior pole of petal. Level three is when you go above the superior pole. So this is example of a patient where uh, there is type two petal and there is some petal uh, mal tracking. So this I am waiting for the cement to set. Once cement is set, we check for the tracking. You can see that petal is lifting off. So yeah, I do a lateral. I elevate the lateral flap, go below the fascia. I see the petal is uh, lifting off. It's not tracking in the center. So we do a lateral. Uh, elevate a lateral flap, and we do a lateral retinacular release. It's outside in technique. So usually we can identify the bleeders. 
There is usually one bleeder in the junction of the lower third and the middle third. So we are releasing the uh, lower third, coming up to the middle third. As we keep releasing, the patella falls back in the uh, groove, trochlear groove. So now we have gone up to the level 2 release. And I can see this patella is almost uh, coming back. Okay. So once you've done the release, we can see the patella is tracking normally. So it's outside in technique for patella resurfacing. So again, we uh, close the joint. The geometry of the patella varies, but most of the dome-shaped patella or uh, uh, offset dome are uh, helpful. Coming to anterior knee pain, anterior knee pain is one of the major cause for dis dissatisfaction after a TKR. So uh, we should not. Uh, um, we should look into uh, patellofemoral joint to prevent anterior knee pain. So, coming to the literature, the, the literature is vastly divided. This paper is RCT comparing uh, patellar resurfacing, 10 years results. And most of the parameters are similar in both the groups. And uh, there is no significant difference between the two groups according to this paper. There is a newer literature saying that there is higher chance of re-operation after 5 years if you have a non-resurfacing. There is no significant difference up to three years and there is no uh, difference in incidence of anterior knee pain or functional score. There is one more meta-analysis which says that if you have a patellar uh, resurfacing, the reoperation rate is 1% compared to 6.9% if you don't resurface. But again, resurfacing is easy. So this is a recent RCT comparing 20 uh, meta-analysis comparing 20 RCTs. There are statistically significant difference favoring the resurface group in the knee component and functional component of the knee society score. This article uh, states that the uh, functional outcome is slightly better in resurface group and there is a slightly higher incidence in uh, for resur secondary resurface. So my indications, uh, most of the PS knees, uh, except in type 1 patella with intact cartilage, uh, CR knees with patellofemoral arthritis, inflammatory arthritis, isolated patellofemoral arthritis, post patellectomy, and patients uh, who have a higher functional demand like frequency, like uh, star climbing, I resurface the patella. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir, for the fantastic presentation. Uh, you have almost covered everything regarding the patella replacement. Uh, there was just one question in the uh, chat box. I request you to answer if possible. So, patellar size is, uh, if it is less than 16 mm, I don't resurface because when you try to cut and then put a 6 mm poly on that, it's going to fracture. But if it's a very bulky patella, again, uh, I would like to resurface and reduce the uh, anterior uh, lever of mechanism. So, uh, most of the time, uh, uh, there is no uh, con uh, contraindication except if it is less than 16 number. I hope the uh, question is answered. Next, we will have a lecture on balancing in the virus knee. This will be delivered by Dr. Dejit Palsan Mandanda. He is a complex trauma and arthroplastic surgeon working in Alfred Hospital, Melbourne, Australia. He did this MBBS and MS from our own institution, Calgary Medical College. He did this arthroplasty and uh, sports surgery fellowship from Germany, UK, and also from Australia. Over to you, Rajat. Thank you, sir. Am I am I loud and clear? Yes. Yeah. You can start, Rajat. Good evening, everybody. So, um, I know that it is very, very late, almost 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock in the morning. It's 3, 3 a.m. here, sir. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so good evening, everybody. Uh, once again, thank you for giving me the opportunity. I'll run straight into the topic. So I've been asked to speak about soft tissue balancing of the virus knee. So there's been some amazing talks about the cuts um, and the alignment. So I'm not going into the detail of all those. So basically, what is a virus knee? So virus knee, the MACWA line, um, which you know intersects from the the center of the femoral head to the talus normally passes through the center of the knee. In a varus knee, it passes media. 
So basically you have a knee and the defect is mostly in the tibia. So one thing you need to remember for, for, as basics is the varus deformity is usually in the tibia, valgus deformity is usually in the femur. So you cannot generalize it, but this is kind of the basic. So basically what happens is uh, the defect is in the medial condyle of the tibia. And as a result, um, and as the deformity progresses, the structures on the medial side will be contracted and the structures on the lateral side becomes um, lax and expanded. So basically, you've got a pathology on the medial side of the tibia and um, medial, femoral, medial tibial condyle and uh, st structures, medial, the medial MCL constricted on the medial side. So coming to the principles of soft tissue balancing, as all the speakers have mentioned previously, our aim is to get an equal and rectangular gaps between the resected bone surfaces in flexion, extension, on, and with equal tension on medial and lateral sides without changing the anatomical joint line. So no matter what kind of cuts you take, at the end of the day, you should have a good rectangular flexion and extension gap. And it should be the same throughout the range of motion. You know, the earlier book said only in flexion and extension, but these days mid flexion and stability has become a topic of debate. So you need to have good tissue tension on medial side and lateral side and throughout the range of movement with good alignment in all three in all these three situations. So basically we've got a pathological lesion on the medial side and we need to correct it. So how do we look at the balance? So there are several ways. You can use the spacer blocks like you saw on the videos earlier. You can use um, and, and the retractions, tissue retractors, or you can um, uh, use the um, uh, distraction devices, specific distraction devices. And what I usually tend to do is either use the block in the first, and once you put the trial implants, do various, val various valgus stability um, with the trial implants on. Now, a very short note on the anatomy. It is very important to know what are the structures on the medial side of the knee and what we need to correct. So basically, in a varus knee, you've got a tight medial compartment. I'm repeating this again and again because there are very few things that as a new surgeon into arthroplasty need to know in terms of varus knee. Thankfully, varus knee is one of the most common knees that you will encounter. So basically, on the medial side, the most important structure is the MCL. The MCL medial collateral ligament has got a superficial and deep. Now deep is something that we would resect in most of the cases. Superficial is a big structure and I'll show it in the next slide. And it is one of the most important structure that you need to be careful and protect. And then just behind the MCL, we have something which is called as a posterior oblique ligament. And just behind the posterior oblique ligament, you have the semimembranosus expansion. And all this will fuse with the posterior capsule. And just behind the posterior capsule, uh, you have the PCL and the popliteus. So I'm not going into the lateral side because I'm sure um, the next speaker, uh, Prince, is going to enlighten you with the, uh, the release in the valgus knee. So basically on the medial side, the structures are the MCL, the POL, posterior oblique ligament, the semimembranosus, and this is all covered on the top with the PES anserinus, as you can see here, which has got the semi-T and the gracilis. So in in a varus knee, what happens is there is contracture of the medial structures. Now, MCL is very, very important. So MCL is a dynamic structure. As you remember this animation, every, every time the knee goes into flexion, the anterior portion of the MCL becomes taut. And every time it goes into extension, the posterior portion of the MCL becomes taut. So in extension, all the structures on the posterior aspect of the knee, so which are the BOL, the semimembranosus, the posterior capsule, all gets tight. Whereas in flexion, the anterior MCL is the tight structure. This is very important because, you know, this is more like a double bundle ACL, as you would say, um, because this variable strand tension of the MCL actually helps in balancing the knee, which I'll come into in the next few slides. So remember, uh, one thing which I always remember was AF and PA. Atrial fibrillation causes pulmonary embolism, anterior in flexion and posterior in extension. So basically, in flexion and extension, the most important structure that helps in balancing the knee is the 
uh, medial capsule and the medial collateral ligament, both the superficial and the deep. And of superficial, the anterior is taught in flexion and the posterior is taught in extension. And every structure behind the MCL, namely the POL, semimembranosis, posterior capsule, and the sansurinus are tight in extension. Now, Various knee, balancing of the various knee, thankfully, the, the approach itself, which you have seen multiple videos, and I'm not going into the detail of those. So a medial parapetalar approach, you excise the anterior meniscus, um, anterior medial meniscus, and then you stay on the bone and use something like a cob elevator or a brusto to, you know, lever out the medis superficial S, superficial MCL, and then hold the tissue in tension, as you can see here, and then release the structures of the tibia. Now, when you're releasing the structures from the bone, the structures that you're releasing is the medial capsule and the deep MCL. So you sacrifice the deep MCL in most of the cases. And once you externally rotate the tibia, you can have a good vision of the whole of the medial tibial plateau taking care to protect the MCL. You know, you need to have a good assistant to ensure that every time you do this procedure, the medial collateral ligament is protected. And remember, at any point you need to look, you, need to, you may need to see the ligament, you need to feel the ligament and you need to move. So it is basically like anything in medicine, you need to look, feel and move and make sure that the tension is good on both sides. After you expose, always remove the osteophytes. Remember, osteophytectomy is a very important procedure, as um, Dr. Rajanish mentioned earlier. It is important to remove the osteophytes because that itself can, you know, help with the release. So always start simple. As, as new surgeons, think simple. No ligament should be released until all the osteophytes are removed. And always start balancing inflection. Why? Because I mentioned to you earlier that in extension, there are a lot of structures that are actually taught. And if you start balancing an extension and start releasing all those structures, you're going to end up having a very lax uh, flexion and that is going to create troubles for you. Let's not start with troubles. So different scenarios that you can have. You can have a well-balanced knee in flexion and extension. Good, put in your implants and get out of the theater. You could have tight in flexion and balanced in extension. Tight in extension, balanced in flexion or you could have tight inflection and extension. Now, you know, in Australia, we get many of the patients presenting early and in 90% of my patients, I don't have to do any balancing because they present at very early, very early age. However, if you go to the countryside, you get many patients like how we got back home, significant deformity and need extensive release. So repeating the same thing, if it is tight inflection and normal in extension, we need to release the anterior portion of the MCL. So because it is tight in, so usually you release that using a half inch osteotome, you stay on the bone, release up to eight to 10 centimeters, make sure you don't injure the pest, you go eight to 10 centimeters, as you can see in the cadaveric model here, eight to 10 centimeters, just releasing the anterior structures. And every time you do a release, take your time, do step by step, and then reassess the um, um, balancing. The posterior portion should be left intact because that is contributing to more extension. Okay, again, just to remind you, AF anterior inflection and posterior and extension. Now, if it is tight in extension and balanced inflection, so what do we do? So again, we always keep the knee in flexion, release the structures on the posterior aspect. So you start off with the posterior oblique ligament, which is directed in a 45 degree manner like that. And then if still it doesn't, and then you reassess. If it's still tight, you may have to release the semimembranosis. And if it's still tight, then you would tend to release the posterior capsule from the femur. Now, as you would have noticed, in a varus knee, you release everything from the tibia. But if if it's still tight, you may have to release the capsule from the uh, posterior aspect of the femur, and that also helps in correcting the flexion deformity, which Samir will be talking to you a bit later on. So every step release and then check again, release and check again. Sometimes you know that it's a significant virus deformity. You have, you do all this as a single step in the beginning, but as a beginner, go step by step. And once you get the hang of it, things come easily to you. Now, if it is tight in flexion and extension, what do you do? So you've released your, you've taken the osteophytes, you've released the deep MCL, you have released the medial capsule, and it's still tight in flexion and extension. In which case, you, there are things that you can do are number one, 
you can try something which is called as needling or pie crusting. So needling, what you can do is you use a 16 or an 18 gauge needle, make five to six holes in the MCL and then slowly stretch it and see if it works. If not, do another five or six. Be very, very careful. Ex you know, extraordinary force can actually damage the MCL. So be very careful. That's called needling. And that's what I tend to do. The other thing which you can do is called as pie crusting. By resting, what we usually do is you use a 11 need, your 11 knife, and you make transverse cuts on the MCL, three to four cuts, and then extend it. And this is very similar to the skin graft. You make the cut on the skin grafts to extend the surface area. That's exactly what you're doing here. And if it, in spite of releasing everything, you still think that it is not getting better, you can try to release the whole of MCL. Now the question comes, you're releasing the whole of MCL, how does it How does it stabilize? Yes, it does stabilize because you remove it as a sleeve. You're not cutting it to two piece. You're releasing off the bone, it is just pulling out to length and then it corrects itself. Now, the other thing which you can do is downsizing the tibial component and lateralizing the tibial tray. So what imagine if there is a if this is the you know the cross section the transverse cross section there is an uncovered area here and what we usually do is that is acting like an osteophyte and stretching the ligament so you reduce the size of the tibial tray suppose we measure a 5 you go to a 4 and then excise that small piece of bone which is actually over you know overhanging and Imagine that's an osteophyte, but this can be done only as Dr. Rajanish said, said earlier, if it is a sclerotic bone, if it is a soft cancellous bone, you shouldn't be doing it because that will lead to subsidence. Just a clinical demonstration of exactly what I mentioned earlier. You can see that thick sclerotic bone on the medial side. You can mark it out. You can put the implant more lateral than medial and then remove that using a saw or mm, a nibbler. Now, in spite of all this, you still have got issues with flexion and extension. Then you go to the next step. You may have to release the pes anserinus. The pes anserinus you know, consists of the semiti and gracilis, and we may have to release it. And when you release that, sometimes this inadvertently causes um, you know, a big gap, and you may have to increase the size of the poly, or sometimes you may have to release the uh, release or advance the LCL on the lateral side. And Last button, you know, lastly, and remember, I repeat it again, once you cut a bone, it's gone. So if nothing works, you can always try to resist the uh, femoral cut at that point, making sure you don't change the, um, the joint line. In complex cases, not for a beginner, uh, especially in revision, I've used this in revision, you can do make, may, medial epicondylar osteotomy because you know you don't, you're still not getting any of the balancing. You take a sliver of the medial epicondyle with all the medial attachment and distalize it to get a well-balanced clamp. So this is usually doing, done in severely contracted various knee. Now, sometimes in spite of all this, you may have to balance the PCL. The PCL sometimes uh, can be so tight and on flexion, what happens is the, the, um, the it, it tends to lift off, in which case you may have to do a PCL recession from the femur or the TBL side, which will be dealt much better by Samir in the um, flexion contracture talk. So basically, what I have to say is only release what is required and always check after each step. So basically, medial capsule, deep MCL, and osteophytes should be removed in every case. If it is tight in extension, you release the posterior structures, which is the semimembranosus or the posteromedial corner, which has got the posterior oblique ligament. If it is tight in flexion and extension, then you release the superficial MCL. If it's tight in uh, flexion only, you release anterior and then if it's still tight, then you go into releasing everything else. So you go step by step. So my preference in, in what I usually do is start with exposure, you know, osteophyte removal, deep MCL, medial capsule release. 90% of my patients, that's enough. If it is still tight, then release the posterior structures. Look at the PCL, make sure it is not too tight in flexion. And if it is still tight, I try doing the pie crusting or needling of the MCL. And if it still persists, then I may have to go in for uh, a, you know, a posterior stabilizing implant or a more constrained variant. The take-home message from today, varus knees, the deformity is on tibia. You do everything on tibia. Mild varus is usually addressed with the incision itself and approach. You don't need to release anything. And don't balance before you remove the osteophytes. The osteophytes from the medial tibia, medial femur, and the posterior femur is, should be removed before we touch the ligaments. 
and balance in flexion before extension. Flexion in tight, flexion tightness, you release anterior MCL. Extension tightness, you release posterior MCL. And you reserve the, um, you know, the advanced techniques for severe cases. And let's not talk about it here. And when possible, always preserve bone. Now, for all the youngsters out there, I would suggest reading this textbook, Leo Whiteside, Ligament Balancing and Total Knee. It's one of the basics, I would say, the Bible in total arthroplasty. Thank you. Thank you, Rajit, for the fantastic presentation, stressing all the important points. Next, we will be having the uh, balancing in valgus knee. This will be delivered by Dr. Prince Shanavas Dan. He is the consultant joint replacement arthroscopy and shoulder surgeon at Aston and Scoil Coder. He did this fellowship in arthroplasty from Isakos. He did this uh, shoulder and spine surgery fellowship from South Korea. He did this fellowship in deformity correction from IOA. He did this MBBS from RP and he did this uh, MS Auto from Christian Medical College. Over to you, Prince. Sir, I am not able to share the screen. Share screen. On the world, try it, Oko. Yeah, no, I have started sharing. So a very good evening, everyone. Am I am I audible? Am but I audible? Audible, but uh, screen is not yet seen. Till now. Did you see now? No, no, no. Not yet. Uh, you are sharing. I am sharing the screen. I can see it. No, Prince, you have not opened the presentation. I think. It's the presentation. I have already opened. Mm -hmm. Again, I will share the screen. Yeah, now screen, start screen again. So your desktop is on. Sorry, desktop. I mean, mine. Uh. Yeah, Prince, left, left top corner, there is a box on the Prince. Left click on the corner, there is a link. I will click here. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, visible now. Yeah. Now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. So I will go uh, directly go into the show. So these are the learning objectives in a uh, valgus knee. So uh, understand the pathoanatomy of a valgus knee. Then how to evaluate preoperatively? What are the surgical approaches? So how will you select the implant? How will you do the different bony cuts? How will you balance the soft tissues? And uh, combined rotation. And finally, we'll go into the complications. So valgus knee is observed in 10% of 10% of patients undergoing top knee arthroplasty. Primary osteoarthritis is most common cause for a valgus knee. Uh, other causes are less common. So this is the classification by uh, Ranavath et al. So type one is a minimal valgus with a medial soft tissue stretching. Uh, type two is a fixed valgus which is more than 10 degree and with the uh, medial soft tissue stretching. So difference between one and two is that. Uh, in 1 and 2, even though both are MCL is intact, in 2 it is stretched. But in 1, it is intact and not that stretched. So type 3 is with an incompetent MCL. So coming to the most important part, to know the pathoanatomy, we have bony problems and we have uh, soft tissue problems as well. So what are the bony problems? There is a lateral femoral condyle hypoplasia. There is lateral tibial condyle erosion. Uh, there is metaphasial valgus remodeling of the femur. There is tibial plato, la lateral tibial plato remodeling. So, uh, we know that in a virus knee, the medial structures are contracted and the lateral structures are stretched out. It's just opposite. Here, the medial structures are MCL is lax, stretched out, but the lateral structures, there are, we know there are a lot of lateral structures on, uh, structures on the lateral side. So, the lateral collateral ligament, postural lateral capsule, popliteus, hamstrings, lateral head of gastronomias, iliotibial band, all the structures are contracted on the Lateral side, lateral side. So these structures make things difficult as compared to a virus knee. So the uh, contracture of all uh, these structures will lead to uh, tibial external rotation and a pat lateral patellar subluxation. So look at the video. She is subluxating her uh, knee. Uh, the history is of uh, uh, six, mo six months. For six months, she has got a progressive valgus deformity and so she is not able to walk because every time she walks, 
the uh, patella dislocates so come into the clinical examination a hip examination is a must uh, uh, the the, uh, the examination of the ankle and foot is important because uh, plano valgus deformity is associated with the high failure rates in a cruciate retaining knee look for hyperextension look for any fixed reflection deformity look for patellar tracking range of motion and the most important thing is that if the deformity is correctable or not because if the deformity is correctable we may get away with the uh, usual implants but if it is not correctable we have to arrange constraint implants also so coming to the radiographic planning uh, standing scanograms are very important you have to rule, you have to rule out uh, uh, extra articular deformities and the other thing is that uh, look for coxa valga or coxa valga because that will alter the distal femoral cut in a coxa valga uh, decrease the uh, 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 valgus cutting angle in a coxa valga increase the valgus cutting angle uh, so uh, the one difference is that uh, valgus cutting angle that is a difference between the mechanical and the anatomical axis usually it is 6 degrees in a varus knee but here you have to reduce it to 3 degrees so you can uh, get a standing ap and lateral radiographs in a standing ap radiograph uh, you can actually uh, do the templating what you have to do is you draw the anatomical axis draw a line 3 degree to this anatomical axis and then line perpendicular to this, to this second line at the intercondylar notch so that will give you an idea about the uh, distal femoral resection uh, so similarly the tibia either anatomical or mechanical axis and uh, draw a line perpendicular to that uh, 3 to 4 mm uh, distal to the medial tibial plateau so that will give you an assessment of the uh, bony deformities or uh, bony erosions and that will give you an idea also about uh, any uh, 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 whether you need to uh, use any uh, other uh, uh, bone grafting or any other uh, uh, things to build up the lateral femoral condyle similarly look at the x-ray on the lateral side uh, see for any uh, posterior femoral uh, osteophytes so these are things you can uh, look in the x-ray then coming to the amount of constraint needed so usually a type 1 and 2 you can get away with the usual implants either cr or ps if there's a fixed deformity uh, you may need to do a uh, you may to go a, uh, to, to, to a ps or a, a constraint knee type 3 always go for a constraint or in uh, extreme cases you have to go for a hinge total knee design so constraint i, I mean either a cc a lcck or a tc3 so the difference so there is a confusion regarding ps or cr so some surgeons prefer ps some surgeons uh, prefer cr the ps ps surgeons say that uh, it is inherently more stable because of the post cam mechanism uh, the greater lat lateralization of the femoral component is possible with the ps design and ps pcl is uh, often contracted and limits the deformity correction so a pcl uh, 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 ps i mean uh, ps uh, knee is uh, more stable then uh, as i already told there is an increase association be between a plano valgus foot and a failure of cr implants but the pcl uh, cr surgeons say that pcl release produces a valgus laxity in flexion so coming to the exposure there are two exposures or usual andromedial approach paramedial parapatellar approach and the other is the anterolateral approach which is uh, published by I mean, popularized by keblish so the advantage of a medial parapatellar approach is that patellar dislocation is relatively easy Uh, the disadvantage is that uh, the the, uh, the visualization of the posterolateral corner I and mean, where the pathology lies is very difficult number one number two when you do a uh, lateral release along with the middle parapatellar approach so there is a high chance of devascularization of the patella and late patella fracture and the disadvantage with the uh, lateral parapatellar approach is that you may uh, need a tibial tubercle osteotomy for a eversion of the patella so coming to the cuts so i start with the proximal tibial cut always cutless this is the basic dictum always cutless we know that when when we do a varus knee uh, we take 8 8 or 9 mm from the lateral tibial plateau but here the lateral tibial plateau is already eroded and we also know that lateral tibial plateau is uh, 3 to 4 mm above the medial tibial plateau so if you cut 8 mm from the lateral tibial plateau in a valgus knee you will be cutting a lot of bone from the tibia so make sure that you cut less and it is ideal to cut a 4 to 6 mm from the medial tibial plateau and another thing is that always cut at 90 degrees to the mechanical or anatomical axis if you cut more than 2 uh, to 2 degrees of varus there is a high chance that your femoral component will go for internal rotation that you will come to understand later slides so coming to the next cut 
Uh, that's a distal femoral cut. As I have already explained, your valgus cutting angle should be 3 degrees. So instead of a 6 degree cut, you have to reduce it to 3 degrees because the difference between mechanical and, and, and anatomical uh, axis is 3 degrees in a valgus knee. So if you cut at a 6 degrees, uh, you will be undercorrecting the deformity. So the entry point, it should be a little bit medial. Why? Because there is always a lateral uh, metaphyseal deformity, remodeling of the uh, distal femur. So go a little bit medial. Another thing is that when you cut uh, the distal femoral cut, your lateral condyle, you may be cutting in the air or you may be cutting very less, one or two millimeters. You can see it in the slide that the middle side, you have cut enough bone. You can see the cancerous bone, but on the lateral side, you can uh, rarely, see, you hardly see any cancerous bone. It's mostly the cartilage and structure you see. So you'll be cutting less from the lateral femoral condyle because your valgus cutting angle is only three degrees. So, uh, so after my proximal tibial cut and the distal femoral cut, then I will balance my extension gap. So how will you how will you balance? There are a myriad of procedures. There are a lot of structures to be released. There are a lot of sequence, so many things have been described, but this is a basic simple things as White, uh, White said et al told. The structures which are attached to the uh, center of rotation of the knee, that is the trans epicotal wrap axis of the femur, that is the structures attached to the lateral epicondyle, that is the LCL and popliteus tendon. They are more important in flexion. So again, the structures attached to the center of rotation of the knee, that is attached to the near the lateral uh, epicondyle of the femur, they are more important in flexion or they are more contracted in flexion. The structures away from the lateral uh, femoral epicondyle, uh, they are more important in extension. So the ITB and the postlateral ca uh, capsule which are attached to the tibia, they are more important or they are more contracted in extension. So you see the literature, there are so many procedures, so many things are described about the soft tissue balancing. I'm going not going into the details because all of these releases, they are associated with the late instability and the reported rate is between 2% to 70%. So don't go into the old complicated things as a beginner. So this is the game changer. This was published in 2005 by Chitranjan Ranavat, the inside out technique. This is the most simple thing and it definitely avoids the late instability. So how will you do it? So the inside of out technique. So you release the postlateral corner using a cautery, postlateral corner using a cautery. Then you make multiple stab incisions or pie crust the iliotibial band. So this is called the inside out technique. So the pie crusting te technique, what I do is that I take two laminar spreaders, I jack out or spread out the uh, uh, femur and the tibia. Then I uh, using a cautery. I release the uh, postlateral corner at the tibial cut surface. Then I feel what are the stru uh, tight structures with my finger. Then instead of using a knife, I usually use a 16 number. I usually use a 16 number <coughs> needle and pie crust the iliotibial band and LCL. So once I finished my tibial cut, distal femoral cut, and then I balance an extension, then I go for the flexion gap. So how will you do that? The flexion gap is by mainly by my anterior posterior cut. So this decides the rotation of the femoral component. So we know that the lateral femoral condyle, the posterior femoral condyle is hypoplastic. So usually in a varus knee, we refer the posterior condyles and we keep the uh, G-cut at three degrees of external rotation so that we get a rectangular flexion gap. Here in a valgus knee, the posterior and the distal femoral, lateral femoral condyle is eroded. So you, if you use the same technique, you will be result, I mean, you will uh, put the femoral component in internal rotation. And what will happen if you put in internal rotation, your patella will dislocate. So the other methods, you can use the epicondylar axis. You can draw a line. You can see the uh, line through the blue line through the epicondylar axis, or you can use the white sides line. Sometimes in a severely uh, dysplastic knee where the patella, the, the trochlear glue is dysplastic, it will be difficult. And the most uh, useful thing is that you keep your uh, uh, foreign cutting jig, which is parallel, parallel to the tibial cut. Your tibial cut should be 90 degrees. So you can use a spreader or you can, I usually use, uh, use a spacer block so that I keep exactly parallel to the tibial cut. So if you cut the tibia in varus, your femoral commandant will go for internal rotation and that will result in a patella subluxation or dislocation. So these are the methods, epicondylar axis, white side line, and parallel to the tibial cut surface. 
So coming to the complications, instability reported between two to seventy uh, percent. That was because of the different inadvertent uh, releases. But with the uh, new pie crusting and inside of technique, it, this has I mean dramatically reduced the, the rate of instability. Now. Uh, recurrent valgus instability it's as the result of a distal femoral cut if you cut it at 6 degrees uh, you will be under correcting and it will be resulting in a uh, valgus deformity now, stiffness is common wound problems are more common when you use a lateral parapetalar approach the patellar stress fracture or osteonecrosis when you combine a lateral release along with a uh, middle para para parapetalar approach there is high chance of osteonecrosis patellar tracking problems when you Internal rotative femoral component, you will get a patellar tracking problems, and finally the peroneal nerve palsy because when you correct the valgus knee, you will stretch out the peroneal nerve, and the next day after surgery, when you see in the morning morning rounds, you will see that uh, the peroneal nerve is there is a foot drop. So what you do, uh, you keep two pillows and keep the knee in flexion that will get automatically corrected because that is just because of the stretching of the nerve. You don't need any uh, other surgical procedures for correction of this peroneal palsy. So coming. To the uh, current scenario, this is the latest article. Totally arthroplasty in uh, valgus deformity is still a challenge in 2001. Yes, it's still a challenge because there is still uh, controversies regarding the level of constraint, whether to use a CR, CR or a PS knee, and uh, difficult visualization, especially on the posterior lateral side with the standard middle parapetal approach. And there's high chance of internal rotation of the femoral component, and uh, uh, which will result in a uh, bad patellar tracking. So we know that success will take care. You need to have a proper bone resection. You need to have a soft tissue balance, and you have a you need to have a gap balance in flexion and extension throughout flexion and extension, equal and rectangular flexion and extension gap. So this is the uh, uh, this is the uh, pictures of the same patient which I have shown early. See, this is after the middle parapetalar approach without having any uh, ligament balancing. Or without having any bony cuts, you can see that the patella is dislocating every time I flex it. Now see, after my releases, bony uh, cuts, and after implantation, the knee is absolutely stable. The patella is in the center. You can see no thumb technique. So this is the same patient. You see, just postoperatively the stitches in situ, the patella is stable. It's not dislocating, and it's corrected. The valgus is corrected. The patella, the patella is stable. So again, uh, coming back to the leading objectives, patho anatomy. There is contracture of the medial structures. Uh, there is laxity of the medial structures and contracture of the lateral side structures. Along with the bony uh, deformities on the lateral femoral condyle, distal and posterior, the pre-op evaluation, surgical approaches, implant selection. I have mentioned the bony cuts. The most important thing is the tibial cut. It should be kept to a minimum. The distal femoral cut, instead of the usual six degree valgus cutting angle, it should be reduced to three degrees. Uh, soft tissue balancing, the pie crusting has changed the game. Then the combined rotation, uh, don't uh, uh, use the posterior femoral condyles for a rotation. Uh, I use uh, the tibial cut or the epicondylar axis or a right side line. Complications are more common. So thank you. Thank you for patient listening. Friends, thank you for the presentation. As we all know, valgus deformity is the difficult one to correct. Uh, thank you for the very good presentation, excellent presentation. Next, we will be discussing on how to deal with the flex, fixed flexion deformity. The lecture will be delivered by Dr. Samir Ali Paravat. Uh, he is the senior consultant and head of arthroplasty at Maitra Hospital, Calicut. He is the gold medal winner of uh, MS Ortho examination conducted at that year. He did his MS from Commander Medical College. He did his fellowship in arthroplasty from Germany and from USA. He has a special interest in prevention arthroplasty and robotic and computer assisted PHR. Over to you, Samir. Yeah, on the outside, so let me thank Rajesh sir and Anin sir for giving me this opportunity. So we'll just, even though it's late, we'll just brush through the uh, take care, especially in what we'll do in a flexion flexion deformities. So why the flexion deformity is a concern for all of us? You just look at these two gates. Almost both patients have a similar type of virus deformity, but the pattern of the gait is entirely different for both of us. Because you can see one guy has a reasonable good extension, other has a almost 30 degree like flexion deformity. So when there is a flexion deformity, the patient has to use, excessively he has to use his quadriceps. And there will be an apparent shortening will be there, along with, the, so that the patient have a ipsilateral 
hip, ankle, and back pain, which all make the post-surgery dissatisfied. So what are the causes for a flexion deformities? Especially in case of osteoarthritis, it is because of the osteophytes. But when it comes to the inflammatory arthritis, it is due to the scarring, and later the knee becomes subluxed, and there will be secondary hamstring contractures. So what are the osteophytes we have to look for? Especially when the patient comes with a flexion deformity, you, you have to see, you have to look for the osteophytes, like those who are in the intracondylar notch, those who are in the anterior aspect of the tibia, and most importantly, the posterior osteophyte, and as well as the patellofemoral osteophyte. Especially the posterior osteophyte not only make the knee flexion deformity, but also limit the flexion. So overall make the knee become more stiff. But in inflammatory arthritis is none other than just the scar tissues. So after total knee replacement, how much of flexion deformity is acceptable or residual FFD is acceptable? Up to 10 degree you can accept in osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, because the flexion deformity will tolerate rather than a hyperextension or recurvatum deformity. And up to 10 to 20 degree can be accepted in rheumatoid arthritis because of the inflammatory arthritis, the scar tissues or will stretch over a period of time. But more than 20 degrees never ever acceptable in both inflammatory as well as the non-inflammatory arthritis. So how will you have to assess the patient preoperatively? When you see a patient like this, you might see the patient have a virus. But many of the time, it is not a virus. It is just a flexion deformity. So don't mistake the flexion deformity as a virus. And always examine under anesthesia. Look for the correctability of the flexion deformity, especially in inflammatory arthritis. Because, it, because of the pain, the patient will have a spasm. There will be a pseudo-flexion deformities. And when the, when the anesthesia is done, Usually the soft tissue will relax us, and even though preoperatively might have a 60 degree deformity that become around 20 degree. So you have to examine under anesthesia and look for the correctability of the deformity. And in x-rays, many of the time because of the flexion deformity, if you take a prop through AP views, this will be misleading about the joint in assessing the joint space narrowing. So you have to, what you have to look for a Rosenberg's view. And so be careful about the in joint line. So you need to consider a Rosenberg view. So you will see the notch like this in a Rosenberg view. And the preoperative serial casting can be helpful only in inflammatory arthritis cases. Now we just move to the intraoperative measures. Most importantly, the exposure. I told you many of the times the flexion deformity will be associated with the limited flexion also. So better go for a medial paraparallel type of approaches rather than going for a subvastus or midvastus in difficult cases. And remove all the patellar femoral osteophytes, median and lateral femoral osteophytes will make the exposure more easier. Because many of the times these type of big patellar osteophytes will make the exposure difficult. You just take out those osteophytes for, rather than forcefully flexing the knee to get the range. Then even you can remove the anterior osteophyte or just take a preliminary, just a brush up cut of the anterior femoral is also fine because that will relax the quadriceps. So you will get little more of flexion in those type of cases. And the role of the PCL is always like in valgus is debating. But what do we prefer? The PCL is, is a stabilizer of your flexion gap. So in case of mild to moderate deformity and knee with a reasonable good range of movement, try to preserve the PCL is always helpful. But in severe deformities, fix, severe fixed contracted flexion deformities, limited range of movement, big osteophytes behind the PCL, better to sacrifice the PCL and do a PS knee will make your work much more easier. Unlike these cases, we can definitely we can do a CR knees, even you might feel that you have to go for a PS knee. And about the bone cuts, even if you see there is a 20 or 30 degree of flexion deformity, never ever go and jump and take more of a distal femur rather than 9, 11 or 30. Because the flexion deformity can be due to the posterior capsular contracture or because of posterior osteophytes. 
because if you initially if you take nine or thirteen mm, and once you take the osteophyte from the posterior aspect, you will end up in knee with a recurvatum deformity and other problems that will dealt in some other slides. So always start with nine mm, make the mark where your cut mark is there, and any time you can revise the cut. Is always to recut is easier rather rather than once you cut and rebuild it. And about the tibia, always take a standard seven nanomm millimeter, depending upon the deformity, and give an anatomical slope. Always, almost always, there is a confusion whether I'll give more slope or less slope. It is like if you cut a tibia in a varus, your MCL relaxes, and if you cut more posterior slope, your posterior capsule relaxes, you will get an extension. But some recommend that you have to take a neutral cut. But if we take a neutral cut again, that will tether the posterior capsule. That will limit the extension. So always go for an anatomical slopes. And about the rotations, the epicut of the femur, you have to give the rotation as per the deformity. And if you go in between the sizes, go for the larger size because the flexion deformity means the extension gap is tight, the flexion gap is loose as compared to both each other. So how we can compensate the flex loose flexion gap? You just go with the upsize of femur. Otherwise, if you downsize the femoral component, your flexion gap become again loose. So you will end up in taking more and more distal femur to compensate the loose flexion gap. So that is not advisable. And next, after taking the osteophytes, followed by you have to strip the posterior capsule from the posterior femoral condyle and the posterior medial aspect of the tibia, especially in varus knees. So there are different methods. If either you can put a fem femoral component and using curved osteotom, or the, this is my preferred method. You put a laminar sp spreader on the other condyle so that you can easily see the posterior part of the knee and just strip it with a blend curved osteotom or periosteal elevator, whatever it is. And the, about the distal femoral resections, up to 30 degree of deformity, you can very well manage with a nine millimeter cut. And 30 to 45, you might require 11 mm cut and more than 45, you might require 13 and never ever beyond 30 millimeter cut. Because the more the distal femur you resect, it can affect your collateral integrity, it can produce midflexion instability, it can produce patella baha, and it can produce patella femoral kinematic issues, all lot of issues as uh, Rajesh Sar has mentioned in his talk. But in severe deformities, you might have to consider the preoperative serial casting or even and thus run out of the transverse dissection of the posterior medial capsule. And can sometimes, very rarely, if you want to, to balance it, you might require sometimes the constraint implants will be required or postoperative splinting also should be there. Because of not the flexion deformities, many of the time it won't be an alone scenario. There are some special scenarios will be there, like the flexion deformity can be due to a bony deformities, extra tibular deformity. Either you have to do sometimes that you might have to do a corrective osteotomy, single stage and two stage that beyond this limit of this talk. And bilateral flexion deformity, if the patient is medically fit, better to a bilateral single stage take care. Because if you do one side now, that flexion deformity will be corrected. But unfortunately, the second stage got delayed. The patient will walk will tend to walk the, with the knees flexed so that again predispose the residual flexion deformity. And many of the, the long-standing flexion deformities can associated with a patella baha. When you deal with such cases, you should set certain precautions, especially even the deformity is more. Never ever take more distal femur. So what will happen if you're not taking distal femur, your, your extension gap going to be tight but your flexion gap is become adequate. So how will you manage the tight extension gap? You have to resect more tibia. So when you resect more tibia, your flexion gap become loose, extension gap become adequate. So that loose flexion gap can be managed by upsizing the femur. Because in the case of flexion, patella baha, if you take more distal femur, that can again predispose or precipitate or aggravate the patella baha, and that will limit the further flexion of the knee. And many of the times, because the cordyceps is not working properly, they will have a cordyceps lag postoperatively. So in these type of cases, you can try the preoperative prehabilitation, basically. And many of the time, if you go for an anatomical closure, that can produce an extensor lag. 
So there is a trick known as the advancement of the medial capsule. Just we'll discuss it. So this is your medial parapetal approach. So this is your medial flap and this is your lateral flap. So what you'll do, you just cast the posterior, the med, supramedial pole of the petal and just pull it proximally. So the medial flap is here, the lateral flap is here. And this is the new area. And at that level, you just put a stitch and passively flex the knee. So that from this image, you can see the ligament petalae got very relaxed. But in this case, the ligament petalae become tight. But at the same time, the patient is maintaining the flexion. So the patient will have a lit, need little more little energy to do an extension. So that will help to avoid the cordyceps lag. And postoperatively, keep a pillow under the heel. Never ever allow the patient to keep the pillow under the knee because the patient will have a tendency to keep the pillow under the knee because for a long standing, they'll have posterior pain will be there because you have stressed the capsule, you have released the posterior medial tissues and definitely Finally, you have to use a nighttime knee brace because during the sleeping, the patient will have a tendency to keep the knee flexed. So the take-home message is understand the pathogenesis. Preoperative measures are useful in inflammatory arthritis and don't consider the distal femur resection at a first stage. And identify and remove osteophytes and adequate posterior release have to be is the key in managing the flexion deformity. And this advancement of the medial flap to reduce the chance of cordyceps lag will give you to correct the flexion deformity. Thank you. Thank you, Samir. It was a very fantastic presentation, well illustrated, and you have covered the entire aspect from the preoperative evaluation to postoperative uh, rehabilitation. Thank you very much. Next, we will be discussing on the uh, pain management in the TKR. So, patient is basically coming to you for pain relief. So, this is, I think, one of the most important lectures. Uh, Professor Gobinathan, uh, he uh, was working in Calicut Medical College. We were colleagues and uh, he, I consider him almost like my brother. So, uh, he is uh, the chief editor of uh, Journal of Orthopedics. He has uh, multiple qualifications and he was the ex uh, uh, former president and secretary of the Kerala Automatic Association. Over to you, Gobi. I take this opportunity to thank the organizers for giving me this uh, chance to present one important topic in PKR the post op analgesia. And Dr. Rajesh has made my job very easy because he has told me to present what I do. So I just br brush through what I do for my patients. TKR is one of the most common orthopedic procedures and lack of adequate post-op pain management leads to catastrophic results, even if you use the best gadgets available. The P fibers, these are, there's a huge accumulation of P fibers around the normal knees or diseased knees compared to the hips. So TKR is a more painful surgery in the post-op period than CHR. Pain induces fibroblast growth factor proliferation and the fibroblast growth factor leads to a lot of fibrosis in the intraarticular and extraarticular region. And this leads to arthrofibrosis, stiffness and reduced range of motion. The job of anesthesiologist usually is pain relief within first 24 hours. But for the surgeon, managing at least four to six weeks pain is a must. So pain relief up to four to six weeks is the responsibility of the surgeon. So we feel that pain management is the duty of surgeon himself. Local injections, most of the drugs injected has got a low half-life of less than 24 hours. So the initial claim has died out right now and people are looking for more options rather than local injections. Femoral nerve block, rectal canal block, obturator block, lateral femoral cutaneous block, all leads to very incomplete pain relief and the post of pain is sometimes very severe, even after these blocks. Epidural blocks leads to muscle weakness, urinary tension, mobilization is difficult, hemodynamic issues, and it cannot be kept for a longer time. And our aim should be to have pain relief at least up to four weeks after a TKR, a complete pain relief. So we do only one solution for all. 
the lumbar plexus block for patients the bilateral or unilateral cases in bilateral you can put two lumbar plexus blocks on either sides i think this video is self explanatory the lumbar plexus is a plexus from where you get three important nerves the lateral cutaneous femoral nerve the femoral nerve itself and obturator nerve so here these are the three nerves which are contained within the psoas compartment the psoas compartment is a tense closed facial compartment and any drug which is or any solution injected into the psoas compartment cannot escape to any other facial planes so it will be contained within the psoas compartment so this is also known as a psoas compartment block now this can be used for uh, surgical procedure as well as post op analgesia we use mainly for uh, post op analgesia not for surgical procedure if you want to do surgery in a block you tag sciatic nerve block also so post op pain relief means you need only the lumbar plexus blocks the three in one block sometimes described the psoas compartment block sometimes described some people say it is lumbar plexus block all are the same it is particularly suited for knee joint pain not for any other Uh, pain so if you have foot and ankle pain you have some other block i'll just uh, brush through the video where we first learn what is a single shot technique that's iliac rest and uh, as we all know it is easy to palpate the l4 spinous process now that's l4 spinous process now you just go 3 cm inferior and 3 to 5 cm lateral so that's a landmark for our uh i think the video is stuck i think he has Hello? lost the uh, wifi connection yeah no worry yeah ജസ്റ്റ് കോൺടാക്ട് ചെയ്തിട്ടുണ്ട് നോക്കുന്നുണ്ട് ജസ്റ്റ് റീജോയിൻ ചെയ്യും
Toby for Ghana, screen share here. Ah, thank you. I think uh, we uh, the net got disconnected at this video. Am I right? Yeah, four centimeter distal in Sarah Bradley. Yes, sir. Four centimeter distal to the L4 spine in the Sarah Marachi at that time got disconnected. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. at that point, at that point, it got so that's an entry point. Okay, okay. So that is an entry point for our needle position. Correct needle positioning is very important for pain relief. And local of the access is very important. If you give spinal anesthesia, you need not infiltrate this area. You can directly put your needle because spinal anesthesia does not cause neuromuscular blockade. And nerve location is possible even after spinal or epidural anesthesia. But if you give general anesthesia, you will have to infiltrate this region before you put your needle because the patient will have local pain. Now, the minimum current required to stimulate a, a muscle is 0.3 millivolts, as you all know. So, uh, we have a nerve locating device which is connected to the needle and now you reduce the voltage and if you get the stimulus at 0.3 millivolts, then you are perfectly on the lumbar plexus. So, this is a very crucial step. So, now, locating the needle at the lumbar plexus gives the adequate pain relief. And this drug, when injected into, into the psoas compartment, it cannot escape anywhere. It is a tense compartment and it acts well. So this is a simple short technique. Okay. So once we know what is a, a single shot technique, we can go for the catheter technique. The technique is almost the same. Only difference is that you have to push in a sheath first and then a catheter within. So the technique is the same. You push a sheath in first and then the needle and locate the lumbar plexus. And once you locate it, uh, you can remove the needle and uh, you can pass the catheter. And the catheter will be passed uh, with a very gentle force. You need not push it too fast because the catheter may break and uh, the peripheral catheters are more stiff than epidural catheters. So you can use more force than epidural catheter, but still it should be gentle enough. It will just go through the facial planes. Now, you before you put in the cause, sometimes it will develop some space and the passing of the catheter is easy. Or even if you don't inject the drug, you can pass the catheter. So if you find it difficult, you push in some drug, there will be some space at the tip of the catheter, and then you can uh, connect it to the filter and this complete the placement of the catheter. Now, after placing this catheter, you have to connect it to a, a patient-controlled analgesic pump, which I will come to in the next slide. So this is a just cadaveric demonstration of this technique that is L4 spinous process uh, as I have described in the live patient. So it is three centimeter below and uh, three to four centimeter lateral. That is, this is a cavity is being used just for demonstration. Now we'll go to the anterior part of the cadaver and you'll just see where the uh, airway comes out. Now, when see you have the catheter in this place, in this area, you are right onto the lumbar plexus. You have the femoral nerve, you have the lateral cutaneous uh, femoral nerve, as well as the obturator nerve. So that's why this is known as a three in one block. All the three nerves are blocked with one single shot of catheter placement. This gives complete analysis to the knee, and the catheter can be kept for around four to six weeks according to the patient needs, sometimes three weeks needed four weeks or five weeks, or the patients can decide how long they actually need complete analgesia. And the dilution of the drug can be adjusted so that you can have a pain relief alone without muscle weakness. You can have 0.25 um, bupivacaine or uh, propivacaine, whatever it is, or half dilution 0.125. So according to the patient's needs, you can dilute these drugs. Uh, there are some undesirable side effects, of course, but uh, these are very rare. If you are too medial, uh, and then it's a problem. You will be reaching the intra-article area, epidural injections, but it's quite rare because you're far lateral. Intravascular injections you have to avoid. So these are the simple things you should remember. But most of the time, it's a very safe block because you are very, you are far, far lateral 
of and the spine as such. Now, this is connected to this analgesic pump. Analgesic pumps are available with uh, in the market. Different names are there: neofusor, dosifusor, EC pump. So many are there. Uh, you can the patient can dial this area. This is a dial, and that dial can be rotated by the patient, uh, which releases a drug delivery around one ml per hour, two ml, three or four, up to seven ml can be adjusted. This this is what the patient will do at home. So the patient is discharged with the catheter is an enclosed uh, catheter system. Patient has no access to inside except the dial. So this is a patient controlled analgesic system. This gives complete and total pain relief for whatever period you need. So we have been using for the more than last two decades, and uh, but we do it on our own. We don't uh, entrust uh, anybody else to do it. So if you do on your own, usually it is a good technique, and the patient gets the best pain relief. Thank you all for patient listening. So thank you, Gobi, for the very. Uh, nice presentation and the uh, illustrative videos so if there are any uh, burning questions i think we can uh, discuss otherwise i suggest so already uh, mm -hmm. almost one hour past the uh, original schedule i think we can stop uh, anin what to yeah, do next uh, i think uh, is uh, are there any questions in the chat box on the decisive point you should cut in for almost all questions have been asked yes, one somebody yeah. has asked for the repeat of the landmarks that i think uh, gobi has already done yeah that's it. i think uh, we'll uh, wind up it's too late now nitin is here I think Nitin is also not here, so you can wind up with the vote of thanks. <laughs> it was great. Uh, thank you, sir, for organizing this with all the great faculty. Everybody has put a lot of efforts. Thank you, sir, and uh, please go on with the vote of thanks. So, first of all, I thank the Oasis of Ibaz, especially Dr. Anin and uh, Professor Salvadan, sir, for giving the opportunity. Second, I uh, thank all the faculty uh, for accepting our invitation, especially Dr. Rajit, who is, I think, almost four o'clock in the morning in Australia. Uh, and lastly, I thank all the delegates. And even right now, we are having almost 60 uh, delegates uh, who are still logged in. So I thank all of you. So good night from Gadiget. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, sir. And thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Recording stopped.